Hi there, and welcome to Mr. Carlson's lab. In this video, we're going to take a Hammerlin HQ140X receiver, restore it, and then fully align it. Now, in many of my other videos, I have people asking me, hey, Paul, would it be possible for you to go just a little bit more into detail in the IF alignment procedure of a receiver like this? And I plan to do just that in this video. This Hammerlin HQ140X is a really good example of needing some form of a visual alignment procedure. And in order for this receiver to perform the way Hammerlin intended it to, we really need to go through that process properly. Now, when I say visual alignment, I mean that you're going to need some form of a sweep generator, an oscilloscope, a wobulator, or some form of a spectrum analyzer in order to really set up the IF section properly in this particular kind of receiver. And again, I'll show you where to hook all the test gear in and how to properly align this, as well as the, uh, you know, the crystal filter section and everything like that. So the whole idea is to bring this thing as close to factory spec as possible so in the end when we do a performance test we'll get a really good idea of how this thing operated when it rolled off the factory line. So that should be kind of fun. So what I'm going to do now is get the receiver, put it on the bench here, we'll take a look at the controls on the front panel and then we'll get right into the restoration procedure. Here's a close-up view of the face of this Hammerlund HQ140X receiver. And before I start taking the whole thing apart and getting it ready for the restoration process, I figured it'd be a good idea just to discuss the function of all the knobs on the face of this receiver. So if you're like me, the very first thing I noticed about this receiver is the color of the knobs. What an interesting color choice. Most receivers like this have those, you know, shiny black Bakelite knobs on them. Well, if I was to describe the color of these knobs, it would be milk chocolate brown. Now, if you're to design a receiver like this and, you know, you know, you're kind of looking at this thing on the on the drawing board and you're saying, OK, we're going to make a gray receiver and it's going to have kind of a, a polished aluminum looking rim around it. And we're going to use some silver screws and then we're going to throw some milk chocolate colored knobs on it. You'd think it would never work. But seeing is believing this thing looks really, really good with these knobs on it. In fact, that's what caught my attention and that really attracted me to this receiver and now look at it, it ended up on my bench. So I really like the color choice. I think Hammerlin did a really good job. It really sets this receiver apart. So getting into the function of all the controls on the face here, we'll start with the sensitivity control up here. And really this control is nothing more than an RF gain control. So when we take a look at the schematic here in just a little bit, I'll show you how that controls the gain of the receiver. Just below that, we have a crystal phasing control and a crystal selectivity control. These two knobs work together here. And the whole idea of this little section here is to help you eliminate interfering frequencies. So for example, just say you're listening to some distant broadcast station and right beside that broadcast station is another frequency that's interfering with it. The whole idea of these controls is to allow you to focus in on the frequency that you want to hear and notch out the one that you don't. So you can look at this control here as how much you really want to focus in on that frequency you want to hear. And this is the notching control that you would move around to notch out the offending frequency. Now, when I have this thing hooked up to the spectrum analyzer for the IF alignment, it'll help explain how this works just a little bit better. And you'll see how this thing actually functions. Now, to be honest with you, I've seen many, many Hammerland receivers, HQ140s, I've seen the 129s, 120s, SP600s, and so on and so forth. Lots of the early Super Pros. In fact, I have a couple of them waiting here for the bench. So, I ha would have to say that every single one, not, there wasn't even one that had this section tuned properly. Every single one of them was so far out. So it really makes me wonder how many people have a really good idea of how that's supposed to work. I think people get in there over the years and probably screwdriver that section and just really bring it way off. So in order to tune this properly, you definitely need a visual means of alignment. You can't do that by ear or with a you know VTVM or anything like that. There's, there's just no way. And when you see this on the spectrum analyzer here, you'll get a good idea of what I'm talking about. My earlier video on the HQ120 also shows how the, uh, the crystal selectivity and the crystal phasing works on these receivers here. 
So again, we'll go through this here in great detail and we'll take a look at this section. And maybe in the end, we can even find some frequencies that are interfering with each other and I can demonstrate how this works. So we'll see how that goes. Right beside that is a standby and receive switch, basically for ham radio operators. If you have another transmitter sitting alongside it, you can put this thing into standby when you go into transmit mode. And that's really what that's there for. So if you're just a short wave listener, you can pretty much leave this thing in receive all the time. Pretty self-explanatory main tuning. So this is a course tuning for this side here. And the band spread on this side here is a fine tuning for this side here. So basically it is exactly what it says. It's just spreading the band out, kind of expanding on things. This here is the, the tuning range or the band selector. So by choosing this, you get to choose which particular band you want to listen to here. And it shows everything in megahertz here. So 18 to 31 megahertz. This is 0.54 of a megahertz to 1.32 megahertz. Or if you wanted to look at this in kilohertz, that'd be a 540 kilohertz to 1.32 megahertz and so on and so forth. So you just rotate this to select the band. Right here, we have an antenna tuning section here and that tunes the, the front end of the receiver. So basically what you're going to do is tune the dial to the frequency that you want to listen to. Say you have a, an S5 signal. What you do is just tune this thing back and forth to peak that signal up to the highest reading you can get on this meter. So basically you're just tuning the front end of the receiver here. You're using this to peak everything up. Over here we have a CW tone control. That works when this switch is in the BFO position or beat frequency oscillator position. That allows you to listen to Morse code or even some sideband transmissions. And in the end, when we're you know, trying this whole thing out, testing it out. I'll show you exactly how to tune into some sideband signals with this. It involves using the BFO, the CW tone, tuning this and playing with the sensitivity control on a receiver like this. So much easier probably just to show it than to explain it. If you're just going to listen to AM, AVC or manual would be the position that you want to be in. So you don't want the BFO on. So AVC is basically like a governor in the front end of the radio. When this is in the AVC position, what it's doing is it's electrically turning down the sensitivity when you have a really strong signal and it electrically turns the sensitivity up for a really weak signal. So it's a really handy little you know, uh, a position to have on the switcher. If you just had this in the manual position all the time, you'd have to continually have your hand on the sensitivity control as you're cruising through the bands because some stations would grossly overload this receiver and other frequencies would be completely weak. So the AVC or automatic volume control in this particular receiver does that all automatically for you. So you don't have to turn this up and down. Really nice feature. Down here we have an audio gain control, pretty much self-explanatory, it's just a volume control. We have a headphone jack down here, quarter inch headphone jack. And this here is a noise limiter. So way back in the day, cars had breaker point ignitions. Uh, you know, there is uh, lots of DC motors around. There still are, like, I mean, you, you know, power saws and blenders and cordless drills and stuff like that still have brushes in it. And they make a lot of noise because of the commutator inside. And this limiter really helps to eliminate that mechanical or electrical noise, I should say. So by clicking the limiter on, it will, you know, pretty much eliminate a blender or a power saw or something that's close by. So real handy control. Again, this was put in here when, you know, cars had breaker point ignitions in them. And that really is all the controls on the face of this receiver. So next we'll take a look inside. Here's a look at the inside of the Hammerland HQ140X receiver with the lid open. So the lid just flips up, it's on a hinge here so you can very easily get to the tubes for servicing. So as you can see inside here, there's, you know, the standard surface dust in here that it should easily clean up with just a, you know, some dish soap and, um, you know, a rag, just a very, very mild detergent. So what you see in here and what you know at this point is really what I know. The only thing that I've really done in here is I've changed the two dial lights for the original picture and I just kind of wiped the face down. That's really all I've done to this receiver. What's under the chassis and any surprises that are waiting, we're going to encounter all of those together. 
So if you ever want to light a receiver up like this, just to see if all the tubes are lighting up and say the power transformer is working, you would want to remove the rectifier tube. If you leave this thing in, there's a you know pretty high risk of damage. If this capacitor is shorted or there's any problems in here, you know, you're going to you know, definitely cause some more issues. So pull the rectifier tube if you ever want to do that. You'll notice that there's an exposed fuse down here. This fuse is attached right to the AC line. So back when these receivers were made, you were just expected to know these things. It's not like nowadays. So if you're ever working on one of these receivers, you should really take a look at the manual and know the precautions of working with high voltage. Because, you know, if you were to reach your hand down here, you could get very badly shocked. So you want to be very, very careful with that. So if you're following along and uh, you're servicing one of these things or, you know, a receiver like this, you're doing so at your own risk. Just take care. So over on this side, we have the IF and RF amplification section. There's also a mixer and an oscillator over here. These are the IF transformers here, and this is for the, the crystal control here, so the crystal selectivity control and the phasing control. This is a regulator tube, so it normally glows a, a bluish color, and it's normal for this tube. So if you see the tube glowing blue inside, that's absolutely normal. On this side here, we have a power transformer, rectifier tube, and this is the audio amplification section, the filter capacitor. This is the beat frequency oscillator over here, BFO can over here. So S meter and, you know, just standard stuff. It's pretty much laid out like a Hammerlin HQ129X. You can see that what they did is they just changed their punches and basically made this thing up to date. So they've taken the octal tube sockets out and uh, changed the tube socket size and they've gone with seven pin tubes and, you know, again, just trying to modernize this thing a little bit. So it'll be interesting to see how this thing performs compared to like an old Hammerland HQ129X or 120 or something like that. Where it would really shine would be on the upper bands. So, uh, you know, up in, you know, 28 megahertz in that area like that. If it's, you know, here's very good up there, you know that there's definitely an improvement with these smaller tubes in this receiver here. So that's a view of the inside here. So what I'm going to do now is I'll just flip this thing up and take the thing out of the uh, out of the case here just a bunch of screws on the face and uh, there might be a screw on the back a couple screws on the back and on the bottom here and we'll just slip this thing out I haven't looked at the bottom to see if there's any screws on that side it is pretty flush so there may not be but usually there is yeah I can feel some screws on the back here so this thing will just come forward like this and I'll take it out of the case and we'll take a look at the bottom side well the radio is out of the chassis, and I honestly have to say my very first response to this was, wow, this thing is so incredibly clean. I don't think I've ever seen a Hammerland like this before. In fact, I think it hasn't even been tampered with. Maybe it was used for a short period of time and just put away. Now, a whole bunch of things tell me this. The first thing is that when we take a look at the coils here, we can see we have an adjustment slot in all of them. None of them are stripped or marred or anything. It, they all look very clean. Same with the adjustment capacitors. So everything here just looks so incredibly clean. No capacitors have been changed in here. It doesn't look like any resistors have been changed. So when I removed this thing out of the case, I noticed that there was three RCA branded tubes on this side of the chassis here. So what I did is I removed all of the tube shields Every single tube on this chassis is branded RCA, so I think it even has the original tube set in, in this receiver. Very surprising. So what we're going to do is I'll change out the components that need to be changed, like the electrolytics. So this has to go here. It's a 10 mic, 150 working volt capacitor. There's the main filter capacitor right under here. You can't see it. That'll have to be changed out. And we'll test these Astrons here and see if they're leaky. Be kind of interesting to see if, if they're leaking at all. So there's one here, there's one here, one here, and there's also one under this can here. So if we remove the can, you can see that there's an Astron here. There's two quarter inch nuts on the top of the chassis that hold that in place. And even the nuts have got the original washers under them. So very, very surprising. Let's put that back in place there. Other than that, you know, this thing might actually still be in alignment in everything. So it'll be really kind of neat to look at this on the spectrum analyzer, look at the IF section and, and see how this thing works. Now, you can get to some of the adjustments from the upper portion of the chassis. So there is a good chance that those may have been touched. I don't know. But all of these on the underside here, they all look so clean. Like I don't see any marring on any of the coils on the adjustments here or any of the capacitors. So it's, uh, you know, looking extremely clean. 
Now, one of the nice things about this receiver, if you ever get an HQ140X receiver, there's very little recapping to do because all of these green disc capacitors don't leak. You don't need to change them out. So you can leave these all alone. So if you were looking at a, a Hammerland HQ129X or something like that, all of these would have been paper and foil capacitors and every single one of these capacitors here would have to get changed. They look, you know, they're a tubular style capacitor like this, like a wax cap. So they were nice enough to use these disc caps and they can all be left alone. So it's very little work to be done in here. All the resistors all look factory. I don't see any burning. This filter choke here looks clean. There's no discoloration to this at all. So it doesn't look like the receiver's been placed under any load. Like, you know, the main filter hasn't been leaking. The power transformer looks very fresh. Everything just looks great in this receiver. So what I'm going to do is we'll test one of these caps here and see if they leak. And then I'll change out the filter capacitors here, just the electrolytics, and we'll put power to the thing and see how close to alignment it actually is. And then we'll take a look at the IF section. And if the thing hasn't, you know, been screwdrivered at all, this will be the first for me. And uh, again, I've seen lots and lots of hammerlands. This one here is extremely clean. So I'll just move the camera and get the cap checker in the shot here. And we'll try this one here first. I'm ready to test this Astron capacitor for leakage now. And as you can see on that, reddish pink looking capacitor it says molded paper so no matter what it's out of there whether it leaks or not but it'll just be interesting to see if it actually does because the receiver looks like it has such low time on it now granted this capacitor is just across the speaker terminals so it really is in a low voltage application it probably would live in this receiver just fine but it's just a good idea to get rid of any capacitors that are a paper style capacitor because down the road chances are it will end up leaking at some time now the tester that I'm going to use puts voltage across these capacitors to test them for leakage. It's not like a standard DMM where you're just testing it for capacitance. So in order to test these things for leakage, you need to put voltage across them. Basically you want to make the capacitor think that it's actually in circuit. So this capacitor is rated at 0 0.05 microfarad at 600 volts. And this tester here will put a maximum of 600 volts across this capacitor. Now this is a Heathkit IT11 tester and it's an absolutely great tester. I really like it, but it is somewhat dangerous just because these probes here, you see this probe that's clipped to the capacitor will have 600 volts on it when I turn that control up. Now, one end of the capacitor is just attached to the chassis. So the negative lead from the capacitor tester is just clipped to the chassis like this. And then the positive is to this open end on the capacitor, just so I can quickly test it. When you click the capacitor tester here from discharge down to leakage, you can see this here, it stays in the leakage position. So if you turn this control up to 600 volts and put 600 volts across the capacitor, that will stay there until you click this back to discharge the switch is not spring loaded now for some applications people like to reform capacitors with these things you know and that might be handy for that but if you forget to click the thing to discharge and you grab a probe like this and you know take the clip off the capacitor you're in for a nasty surprise so if you ever get one of these IT11s, be very, very careful. And if you're following along with one of these old IT11 uh, capacitor testers, you're doing so at your own risk. You really need to be careful with these things. So right now I have it in the leakage position and it's down at three volts. It's the lowest voltage here. So as I turn this up, if this eye closes and stays closed, the capacitor has excessive leakage. So what I'll do is I'll start turning the voltage up. As you can see, it's staying closed for a short period of time. That's just charging the capacitor. That's all that's doing. Okay, right now I'm at 600 volts. And as you can see, the eye is open. Now this is a molded paper capacitor and it's not leaking at its rated voltage. That's almost kind of amazing. So pretty much all paper capacitors that you ever come across, especially, you know, the, the wax ones, they're always going to leak or you know very rarely will they not 
So this molded paper capacitor is not leaking. So right there, this is kind of telling me that this receiver really, really probably has very low time on it. So what I'll do is I'll click this to the discharge position. So now it's discharged that capacitor. Now, when I click this back to leakage here, it's going to charge the cap. So you'll see the eye close for just a moment. And then when it's charged up, the eye should open again if it's not leaking. So here we go. And again, it's not leaking. So very interesting. So technically, you know, I could leave that in circuit. It would be fine. But again, you know, that's against policy. <laughs> All paper capacitors have got to go. So what I'm going to do is just for the fun of it, let's try some other ones. There's three more left. Let's see if any of them are leaking. So if all three that are left aren't leaking, I think it's pretty hands down. Either these are very special paper capacitors or, you know, this receiver really does have no time. Very, very interesting. I have the capacitor tester attached to the second molded paper capacitor, and it has the same ratings as the last one, 0.05 microfarad at 600 volts. So you can see it kind of hiding behind this terminal tie strip here. If I move this capacitor out of the way, you can kind of see the top of it here. One end is tied to the chassis, and the other end is tied to my probe, and I've got my probe suspended here so that it doesn't touch anything else. So again, the capacitor tester negative is clipped to the chassis, and the positive is just clipped to the open end of the capacitor. The capacitor is not in circuit at all. So I'll click my capacitor tester to leakage, and... Let's see if it leaks. So I'll slowly advance this here. That's taking a long time to open. So it's looking like it's going to be leaky. That's a 250 volts and it's starting to show leakage there. You can kind of tell it's, see how it's kind of jolting. So at 300 volts, I definitely say it's really bad. Now the capacitor is rated for 600 volts, so it's leaking at half the voltage. So say this capacitor was attached from the plate of an earlier stage to the grid of say an output tube or something like that. So say this was in a guitar amplifier, all right? And say this was attaching the plate of the preamplifier tube to the grid of the output tube. This capacitor here would be causing that output tube to red plate. All right, so it would be putting a positive voltage on the grid of, say, a 6L6 or a 6V6 or some output tube like that. And that's what destroys these guitar amplifiers and burns out output transformers and does things like that. So this is a really good example of a leaky capacitor. Now, if somebody was to just go and test that capacitor like we just did, you'd think, ah, oh, they're probably all okay because you know, it's not leaking. But as soon as you see the word paper, molded paper, paper and foil, or anything like that, you don't take any chances. They all have to go. And here is a pure example of that. So I'm not going to even bother testing this other one here or the other one. I know that these are definitely haywire and we can see that right now. So they all got to go. So I'll replace all of these capacitors and I'll also put in the new electrolytics and we'll take a look at the chassis, how I've done that. And then we'll try out the receiver and see if it's somewhat in alignment. I've replaced the paper and electrolytic capacitors in this Hammerland receiver now. And I've installed the new capacitors right here, 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 and here. So what I've done is I've removed the wires from the old capacitor here. So the old capacitor is completely out of circuit right now. What I've done is I've soldered in these little ceramic standoffs into the existing terminals on this capacitor. So really the old capacitor is just acting as a mount. The wires that I've removed off of the terminal, I've moved to the other end of this ceramic standoff and I've attached the new capacitors to this end with the existing wires. So it keeps the install really clean, and in the future, if this ever needs servicing, it's very easy to service. So that's how I've installed the new electrolytic caps. This one here is just a capacitor on the cathode of the 6V6 here, and it's really just installed to the same area that the old one was attached to here. And you can see I've still got that can off the bottom here, and I've replaced one of the paper caps here, and all the paper caps on the other end of the chassis have also been replaced. 
So now all I have to do is put this filter choke back in, put the screws back in, turn the receiver the other way around, and we'll try it out, see if that's all this thing really needed to make it work again. Be kind of interesting to see if this thing just fires up the first time. All right, let's see if the Hammerlin HQ140X comes to life. So pretty much all I've done since the last shot was turn the thing right side up. I have an external speaker hooked up to it. It's off to the side, so hopefully it sounds okay. I guess at this point it really doesn't matter as long as it makes some noise. I have an external antenna hooked up to the antenna posts on the rear. The receiver is plugged into an isolation transformer and variac supply. The variac is pretty much just turned right on. So there's 120 volts waiting at the on off switch here for this thing to be turned on. I've checked the fuse. This is a nice light value. So if anything goes wrong, that fuse will just go away. One thing to take note of in these older receivers, especially this Hammerland, is they have directly heated rectifier tubes. That 5U4 will pretty much come in within about three seconds of you turning the receiver on. So a good indication that the high voltage is flowing is just keep an eye on that regulator tube. If you see it glow powder blue within about three seconds, you know that the high voltage is working in the receiver at that point. If after about five seconds or maybe a little bit longer, you don't see a powder blue glow, I strongly suggest you turn the receiver off and look for shorts or something like that. And, you know, definitely make sure that that zero C3 tube, which is that regulator tube back here is working as well. So good indication that the, the high voltage is, is working and flowing in the receiver. Now, whether there's shorts beyond that, we really don't know, but it's, you know, a good initialization indication, I guess you could say. Let's see, uh, what else can I tell you? I haven't put the cover back on that uh, 12AU7 tube. I just left it off because I don't know if I'm gonna need to service anything in the receiver, if the thing works or not. So before we start, I'll turn the sensitivity up here. Good thing just to have maximum sensitivity. Crystal phasing can remain at 12 o'clock because the selectivity's off. Needs to be in receive mode. Main tuning, don't really care where that's sitting at this point. It's on the broadcast band, we'll leave it there. Don't know if the antenna's in tune, so we don't need to really adjust that. Band spread, we're on the broadcast band, who cares where that's sitting. A limiter is off. Uh, CW tone pointing at 12 o'clock doesn't matter at this point because we're not on the BFO position. We're going to be pointing the AVC, which it is. So that means that basically it's going to automatically turn the gain down if we come across a strong signal. And this, of course, is in the off position so that we don't have voltage going into the receiver as soon as the variac is on. So limiter off. It's pretty much ready just to try out. So... Here we go. And you can see the regulator is glowing, which is a good sign. I know the dial lights work because I lit this thing up without the rectifier tube just for the original shot, for the original picture. Look at that, carrier meters coming to life. Wow. It's jumping around a little bit there, which usually means that it's listening to something. So we'll turn the volume up. Sounds like it's trying to receive. Look at that. Well, all I have to say is, wow. So when was the last time you heard somebody say, man, I wish it was broken? It's, uh, I was hoping we'd be able to troubleshoot some stuff in this thing together, but it's uh, looking like it's working. Look at the S meter. It looks like it's working and everything. That's, um, wow. So what this is telling me at this point is it's probably really is, uh, you know, a low time receiver. I'm, I'm thinking that there isn't a whole lot of time on this. Nobody's really been in here and screwdrivered it all that much. That's really quite surprising, uh, whether that's a, a testament to Hammerlin dependability or whether it's just the fact that, that it's been left alone is, um, you know, yet to be said. So, wow, that's all I have to say. I'm very surprised. Um, amazing. So what I'll do here is uh, I'll turn the audio gain up here. Let's just uh, test out the crystal selectivity here and see if it narrows up. And it is. So when I come right onto frequency, you'll, you should see this go way up. Wow, that's working as well. So I wonder if the IF alignment is original. It'll be so neat to see. This would be the very first Hammerlin I've ever come across that wouldn't be touched if that's true. So let's see if the BFO works. 
And it's working as well. Wow, so I'll just turn this off. All right, so give it some volume here again. Put this back into AVC. Go on to a, a strong station of some sort. So now it should overload when I put it on the manual position. And it's overloading all right. So you can see how the AVC is electrically turning the gain down for us so that we don't have to do that. It's a nice, uh, a nice little feature. Wow, the whole thing is working. So at this point, what I'm going to do is I'll clean off uh, you know, all the controls, I'll, you know, clean off all the, the wafer switches and stuff inside and make sure that's all done. And I'm going to clean up the chassis as well. Before we do an alignment, the alignment is pretty much the, the last thing you do before you put the thing back into the cabinet, because you don't want to upset anything or interrupt anything after you've done that. So, uh, I guess, Hey, we could actually test the, uh, the, uh, dial accuracy at that point. That would pretty much tell us if the, um, if the oscillator has been played with or how much that's moved again, you know, a coil shrinkage and everything over time can, can affect that as well. So, you know, if it's way, way, way off, then, um, you know, we can pretty much say it, it might've been screwdriver, but I, I imagine it's not going to be right on. If it is, I'll be extremely surprised. So uh, what I'll do is I'll turn on my signal generator and we'll try that next. And then I'll get into that cleaning procedure. I'll clean the whole thing up and then we'll go into the IF and RF alignment. Let's test the broadcast band alignment. So right now I'm sitting just below 820 kilohertz. That's right here. And the signal generator is sitting at 840 kilohertz at 60 microvolts output. No reason for that level of output. It's just where the signal generator was sitting from last time I used it. The 840 kilohertz is modulated to 50% with a 500 hertz tone. So we'll be able to hear that when we tune that on to frequency here. So I'll turn the receiver on. Let it warm up for just a moment and we'll see how close this is. Now I just chose 840 for no particular reason. This was sitting around 820. So I just turned the signal generator to 840. Okay. So it sounds like it's right about there. Let me turn the sensitivity down and take a look at the needle. See if I can get the needle in the shot here. That's right about there. So it's not too far off. It's just a little bit below 840. Let's uh, try 1300. So I'll go uh, 1.3 megahertz and I'll roll the dial up there. There's no antenna hooked up to this thing right now and you can tell it's trying to receive even right now. Thirteen hundred should be right close to the end. So you can see that's a fair amount off on the upper end of the dial. Now the band spread shouldn't affect that. Turn the band spread to a hundred. Yeah, doesn't affect it whatsoever. So yeah, it's a little bit off, a little bit off on the upper end of the dial, but not a big deal. So. Yeah, I guess the verdict is out whether this thing really has been, you know, screwdrivered or not. Let's uh, just try another band. So let's go uh, 3.2 to 5.7. So if we're at 3.2 to 5.7, we're just a little bit above 5.6 right now. So I'll put that at 5.6. That's uh, right on over here. And I'll go 5.6 megahertz. So the signal generator is at 5.6. Let's see how far off this is. So for these bands to be correct, the uh, band spread has to be set to 100 on the logging scale. Yep, 
yeah, it's quite a ways off. So it's just above 5.5, and uh, there's quite a ways from 5.5 to 5.6, and right now we're at 5.6. So at the upper end of the band, they're pretty much even. So yeah, it's hard to say. Might just be from age. At this point, I, I really couldn't say. So when we take a look at the IF alignment, we'll be able to get a better idea if this thing has been been tampered with or not. It'd be kind of surprising if it wasn't, but um, yeah, still, it's not doing bad. This is what the main tuning and band spread tuning capacitors look like inside this Hammerland HQ140X receiver. The reason I have the cover removed off this section right now is just because I'm cleaning the upper portion of the chassis and I want to make sure I get rid of all the dust, dirt, debris and cobwebs and stuff just before we get into that alignment procedure. Again, the alignment procedure is pretty much the last thing you do before you slide this thing back into the case. So you want to make sure that you get rid of all the little fine details before you do that. There's another good reason to remove this as well. You can lubricate some small points in here. If there's any grease in these particular sections, a lot of the times that grease gets hard. So it's always a good thing to get in here and just add a little bit of lubricant to certain little areas inside this. So by having this cover off, we can really see what a great looking capacitor assembly Hammerland has used inside this receiver. This is the main tuning capacitor assembly, and this is the band spread tuning capacitor assembly. What you see in the middle here is the antenna compensation capacitor, and that's that little knob that's right below the S meter. You can see the shaft here leading out to the front face of the radio. You'll see that we have one common shaft joining three separate capacitors together and each capacitor is in its own separate RF shielded box. And the reason they've done that is so that we can tune three sections of this receiver all at the same time just by tuning one knob. So when we tune the main tuning knob or turn that knob, it's going to move all three of these capacitors at the same time. Joining three capacitors together with one common shaft is called ganging the capacitors together. The reason that we gang these three capacitors together is so that all three sections will track with one another. So this capacitor assembly in this box is what tunes the oscillator, this tunes the RF section, and this tunes the antenna section. And it's the same with the band spread tuning capacitor over here. So you can see all the RF grounding that they've used in each box. You can see that these little fingers rub along a disc here. So when you're moving this capacitor, it's maintaining a really good RF ground so that we have minimal leakage between each box. And that's very important so that one stage won't interfere with another stage. So you can really see that Hammerland has done their homework in this area. It really is a great looking capacitor assembly. Cleaning the dials on the Hammerland HQ140X is really quite easy. All you have to do is just remove these two screws here and these two screws here. By doing that, you'll remove these little black spacers and the little plastic window that shields the dial in the front. That little plastic window also has that little black line on it too, and I'll show you how to align that back up here in just a little bit. That's really quite simple. So once you remove this, you can clean the front portion of this dial, the portion that all the numbering is on, through the actual window. Now, when you're cleaning this, I have to caution you, you need to be very, very careful with whatever cleaner that you use. I strongly suggest that you try cleaning the dial in a very inconspicuous area first, because the numbering on the dials can be very, very fragile if it's been left in the sun or in you know a very bad environment. I've seen people remove the numbering right off of these dials. That you know doesn't look very good once you've done that. So again, you know, use a very mild detergent like a dish soap or something like that and always try it in an inconspicuous area first to make sure that you're not going to harm your dial. I was extremely careful even with this when I cleaned it just because I want to make sure that I don't harm any of that numbering on the front portion of the dial. Cleaning the back side of the dial is, you know, it's quite a bit more robust. You can get in here and just wipe the back side of the dial. All you do is just move the main tuning dial and that'll move this around and then you can just clean it. You can pretty much clean the entire dial from the upper portion of the chassis just by doing that. And there's enough room through the window in the front of the receiver to very effectively clean the front portion of the dial. Once you're done, all you do is you just put this all back together. You'll notice that there's a piece of felt on that main front window, that little window that uh, shields you from touching the dial. That piece of felt faces towards this 
plastic disc here. So it doesn't face towards the front of the radio, it faces towards the actual disc itself. So once you have the screws put back in, you want to just snug them up so everything is kind of loose so you can move this whole little section around, but the screws are in. Again, just snug so that if you move the plastic window, it'll stay in that position. Next, what I'll do is I'll show you how to realign that little plastic window with this dial right here. And the same goes for the other dial as well over here. Again, Remember, very important, do not use any kind of harsh solvents or anything on this plastic at all. So no acetone or no lacquer thinner, no alcohol, no anything like that. You know, even water, you might want to try cleaning it with water first. That would be the absolute safest thing to do. In order to line up the main tuning dial with the line on the window, it's really quite simple. All you have to do is just make sure that the window isn't completely tight so that it's, you know, just tightened down snug so that you can still move it around on the back side. Rotate the main tuning dial till these two lines right here are completely vertical. And that'll be right at the bottom end of the band. It'll be right at the stop. So what I'll do is I'll just rotate this until it's at the stop. Right there is at the stop. All you do is just move the window around until this line on the window aligns up with those two little marks right there. Tighten up the window and you're done. Here's a look at the schematic for the Hammerland HQ140X. As I mentioned earlier in this video, I'll show you how the sensitivity control controls the gain in this receiver. And I'm going to also show you how to attach a spectrum analyzer into this circuit so that you can do a sweep alignment. So I'll show you how to attach the tracking generator output of your spectrum analyzer to this circuit. And I'll also show you where to pick the signal out of the circuit and feed it back into the input of your spectrum analyzer. The key to a good alignment in a receiver like this is to make sure that your test gear is very lightly coupled into this circuit. If you heavily couple any test gear into an IF circuit like this, when you remove the test gear, it will greatly affect your IF alignment. So the whole idea, again, is to keep the test gear invisible to the device under test, which happens to be this Hammerland HQ140X receiver. And I'll show you my method of keeping the test gear invisible to this receiver quite shortly. I'll start explaining the sensitivity control here. So the sensitivity control is R39. It's a 10K potentiometer, and it's in somewhat of a voltage divider circuit. We can see that there's a 240 ohm resistor attached to ground here, and we can see that there's a 62k ohm resistor going to the B plus line. The wiper of R39, which is the sensitivity potentiometer, is connected to the cathode of V4, which is a 6BA6. This is an IF amplifier, and it's also connected to the cathode of V2, which is another 6BA6. This is the first RF amplifier here. As you move the wiper of this potentiometer towards ground, you're increasing the gain by bringing the cathodes of both of these tubes towards ground. As you turn the sensitivity control counterclockwise, you're bringing the cathodes towards B+, so you're making the cathodes more positive. And by doing that, you're reducing the gain of both of these stages. And that's how you control the gain in this receiver with the sensitivity control. So I'm going to very lightly couple my spectrum analyzer into the circuit here by clipping the signal lead to the case of this 100K resistor. And that will feed enough signal into pin 7, which is a grid in the 6BE6 tube to get the signal through the IF chain. And I'm going to pick the signal off of pin 2 of the 6AL5 tube here. How I'm going to couple into this, this is a very high impedance circuit here. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to clip the signal input lead from my spectrum analyzer to the actual cloth covering on the wire here. So I'm going to very, very lightly couple into this circuit. And that's extremely important at this end. You can see Hammerland has even got a 5 picofarad capacitor coupling into the circuit over here. So we want to very, very lightly couple into this circuit here, or what's going to happen when we tune the IF chain here, if we remove the test gear, everything is going to change. So the tube complement is pretty straightforward. We have a 6C4, which is the oscillator tube. 
And we have a 6BA6 again, which is the first RF amplifier. We have a 6BE6 acting as a mixer. Now, in a lot of radios, the 6BE6 is a mixer and an oscillator all in one too, but in this receiver, they chose to separate the oscillator here. So this is just acting as a mixer. First IF amplifier, second IF amplifier, which is another 6BA6, third IF amplifier, which is another 6BA6. The 6AL5 is for the AVC and the detector here. All right, so this is acting as a limiter and all that as well. We have a 12AU7 here, which is acting as the BFO. And we also have the first audio amplifier here. V9 is a 6V6. And that is just the audio output tube driving the audio transformer here. Down here, we have a rectifier tube, which is a 5U4. It's a directly heated rectifier. And this here is the voltage regulator, that little tube that glows a powdery blue color. This is how I have my spectrum analyzer attached into this Hammerland HQ140X receiver. Both of these white boxes that you see here are just spectrum analyzer protection, and I've done another video on those boxes. If you're interested in seeing what's inside these or building some of these for yourself, I'll link that video just below this video under the Show More tab. So originally I intended these boxes to be interchangeable and to be used with a whole bunch of different devices. Since then, I've just dedicated this one box here to the tracking generator output on my spectrum analyzer. So the only modification I've made to this one box here is I've added a 50 ohm termination across this jack and that's it. So the signal's coming out of my spectrum analyzer and going into the 6BE6 tube here. Now there is no electrical connection between this red lead and the tube here whatsoever. Off of pin 7 of the 6BE6 is a 100k ohm resistor to ground. This red clip here is just clipped to the body of that 100k ohm resistor. The black lead you see here is just clipped to the chassis. Over here is the input to the spectrum analyzer. So the signal is going through the IF chain here and ending up over here at this last IF transformer at pin number two of the 6AL5 tube. The red clip that you see over here is just clipped to the insulation of the green wire that comes out of that last IF transformer. That green wire attaches to pin number two. Just to make sure that this alligator clip doesn't bite into the insulation of that wire, I've taken another piece of rubber wire and I've put a cut in it and I've just put it over the insulation and I've clipped the clip lead to that rubber insulation just to protect that wire. So next what we're going to do is take a look at this on the spectrum analyzer and see if the alignment of this thing is still original or whether somebody's been in here and messed with it. So this should be really interesting. Let's see if this Hammerland HQ140X still has its factory IF alignment or at least try to determine that at any rate. So we'll turn on the spectrum analyzer. Hopefully the fan noise isn't too objectionable. And I'm not sure where I was last with the analyzer. That's quite a ways off from where we need to be. So I'll have to critique things here a little bit. Okay, so the center frequency for the IF in this receiver is 455 kilohertz. And that's pretty standard for most AM receivers now. So it's not necessarily going to stay at 455 kilohertz just because we're going to have to tune this to wherever the crystal frequency is sitting. And I'll get into that here in a little bit. But we'll start at, you know, 455 being the center. So a nice comfortable span is about 20 kilohertz. So that's 10 below and 10 above 455. So I'll set the spectrum analyzer up here. So 10 below 455 is 445 kilohertz. So I'll start frequency, 445 kilohertz. And the stop frequency will need to be 10 above, which will be 465 kilohertz, 10 above 455. So stop frequency, 465 kilohertz. So that'll put our center rate at 455. You'll notice a little dot on the screen here, moving around. That's me moving the marker around. I'll try to use that to point with, instead of, you know, doing this. But I can't guarantee that's going to happen. So now that this is ready to go, the receiver setting should be the crystal selectivity needs to be in the off position the crystal phasing control is at 12 o'clock the sensitivity control doesn't really matter where it is right now the manual avc and bfo should be in the manual mode and in a little while here i'll uh, i'll explain a little bit more about that they suggest that you 
do the full alignment in the manual mode that's fine to do but in the end if you're going to use this thing in avc mode all the time i strongly suggest you know once you have the alignment done you know just finalizing it in the avc mode just to make the pattern look really nice i uh very rarely use the manual mode on these receivers it's you know pretty much always in avc and there's no reason almost no reason why you need to use it in manual so i want to make the pattern look the best and of course that's going to make the receiver sound the best when it's in the avc position so yes the avc position does affect the pattern and uh, maybe i can even display that with this receiver here it always does so when it's in the avc position it's you know putting a negative voltage on all the grids of all of the um, you know the if tubes and the rf tube in this receiver so i'll explain that here in just a little bit but we'll start with everything in the manual mode so it needs to be in the receive position the toggle on the front should be in receive the bfo is you know the cw tone can just point at 12 o'clock it doesn't really matter where that is the limiter can stay off and um that's pretty much it. Uh, have the dial at the bottom end of the broadcast band, so the main tuning dial should be right at the stop at the bottom end. Okay, I think we're pretty much ready to go at this point, and I'll just kind of explain this as we encounter things here. Okay, so here we go. Turn the receiver on. I have to wait a little bit because it's got to warm up. And here we go. We're starting to get a pattern here. I wouldn't say that that's necessarily looking like a factory alignment at this point, but not bad. So you can see where the little bright dot is. That's at, you know, 455 or very close to, you know, right here's at 455. And we can see the peak where they've tuned the peak to is at about 453, 400, something like that. So to give you an example, if you were to tune into a radio station, when it appears to sound like it's right on frequency, would be when you're at this point of the curve right here. So as you're tuning the dial, you know, you'd be coming closer and closer and closer to this, and all of a sudden, oh, it sounds like the radio freq you know, station's right on frequency at, uh, you know, around 453, 400, something like that. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, isn't it supposed to be at 455? That's the center. Well, in, in optimum conditions and say the crystal in the crystal selectivity box there was cut exactly for 455 and everything is perfect, you know, uh, yeah, it would sit right in the center. So what's going to really tell me whether this thing has its factory alignment or not, or, you know, even at this point, whether somebody went through this and did a very good sweep alignment, will be if I turn the crystal selectivity to position one or two, and the sharp peak is right where that little dot is. So when you have a spectrum analyzer with a tracking generator hooked up to a receiver like this, it's very easy to see where the crystal frequency is right at the point of maximum amplitude is where that crystal frequency is. So what I'll do now is I'll switch the crystal selectivity position here to position number two. Again, it's in the off position. So this is the widest position. This would be the most comfortable listening. So say you're in a, you know, cruising the shortwave bands, you wanted to listen to some nice AM broadcast. This would be the position you'd want to be in. When you want to pull stations out of the mud, uh, or say there's somebody interfering with a station, you'd want to, you know, click this switch on and narrow things up like that. So this is position one, and this is position two. And as we can see, that dot is very close to that peak. So we're probably talking you know, 100 and some odd hertz, maybe 200 hertz, something like that. So we're at, uh, say, 340. All right. 453, 340. So that's about 200 hertz to say 540 would be at the peak, maybe. Maybe 520, 180 hertz, something like that. That is very, very close. So it's looking to me like this may have its factory alignment. And, you know, looking at this might be just the way that their machine or their their uh, sweep setup at the factory may have loaded this or the way that the fellow that aligned this at the factory had hooked this into circuit. Now, the reason why I think so strongly at this point that this is factory is because the, the little rods that are threaded that move the slugs up and down in the IF transformers, they don't have any scoring on them at all. So there's a little, uh, almost like a, a spring tensioned washer that keeps them tight. And those are, you know, I guess you could say um, 
it's pretty common for those things to mar up the little brass shafts that are coming out of these little IF transformers, the little threaded shafts here. And I'll show you them here in just a little bit. And there is absolutely no marking on them at all. And where you stick your screwdriver into the end, they're absolutely clean. So I'm really beginning to think that this thing does have its factory alignment. And I think what will be the, you know, the final, you know, determining point is when we try out the crystal phasing control and see where its positions are. And if we can pull a notch up on either side of that, you know, narrowed IF, if we can pull a notch up on either side of this, I would be pretty sure that this is probably the factory alignment in the, the fellow who tied their sweep circuit into here, probably maybe coupled it a little bit heavy or something like that. So, all right, so here we are, crystal selectivity position number two. And let's look at the phasing. The phasing is pointing right at the arrow. So it's right at 12 o'clock right now. Okay, so I'm going to see if I can straighten the pattern out a little bit. You see how it has a little bit of a dip on one side there? So over here, you can see there's a bit of a dip, right? And, you know, a perfect situation, you would want this to come as straight down as possible, all right? Even though we're at 5 dB per division here, we would, you know, want this to come straight down. So what I'm going to do is move that crystal phasing control and see if I can straighten this out, all right? So I'll just move it over to one side here. And you can see I'm straightening it out at this point. That's looking more like the way it's supposed to look. You can see it's kind of shifting. Oh, you can see that notch is starting to come in now. So there might already be a notch coming in below the screen here. So I'll go dB per division. We'll go to 10 dB per division. And no, it's not coming in yet. So this is the noise down here. And you know, this is basically what we're looking at up here. So I'll, to get rid of this a little bit, I'll go back to the other it's a 5 dB per division there. All right, so I'll take a look at where this is. And it's just a little bit. I would say it's at uh, 11, maybe at 11 o'clock, just a little bit before 12 o'clock. So it's very, very close to the center at this point. So at 12 o'clock, you know, we're dealing with this. Now, to get an alignment like this, you have to do a visual alignment on this thing. If you're going to try and do this without some form of a visual means, this is very, very, very hard to achieve this. Uh, so if you're going to be using a signal generator and doing that method with a VTVM or an oscilloscope or something like that, uh, it's very hard to achieve this. So if you were to play with the two little screws on the top of that transformer, let's see if I've got that piece of paper here. This transformer right here, hopefully you can see this. I don't know if it's in focus here or not. I have the focus fixed. If you play with the two little adjustments right here on the top of this transformer, it'll completely destroy this. So it takes quite a bit of uh, movement to get this like this. So it's really starting to look factory. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and pull a notch up on that one side. We saw one coming up over here before and we'll see how that looks. So I'll go right to about, oh, nine o'clock. I'll move it right to the zero position. Okay. And look at that notch. That looks great. Nice steep slope into the notch looks just absolutely great. So I'll return it back. And that should be looking at the screen should be about pointing at the four. And it is. It's pointing at the four. So this would be right at the 12 o'clock position here. Extremely close. This could be really critique too if you wanted to play with the settings on the top there. And if you really wanted this to sit at this point right here, right at the 12 o'clock position, uh, you could put a, a small trimmer in the box and just trim that up so that it would do that. So a small NPO variable, or NP0, I should say, uh, variable capacitor. Yes, I'm guilty of saying NPO all the time as well. I hear it so much. So let's go to the other side. I'll go towards 
number 10, which should be at the three o'clock position. And we should see a notch come up on the other side now. And if there is a notch that's going to come up on the other side, nice and even like, look at that. Yeah, I, I would really say that this is probably, it has to have the factory alignment. Look at how steep that is. That's absolutely great. Great to get rid of those offending offending frequencies that are interrupting what you want to listen to. And that's why this is so incredibly important to have this particular section working if you want to definitely narrow into some frequencies that are way, way, way out there. And this receiver is working great. So I imagined if some shortwave listener or, you know, some ham radio operator had many of these receivers and picked this one up and started playing with it, this one here would seem like magic because I'm telling you, I haven't come across one of these receivers that's been like this. They are in miles, hundreds of miles out. They're just incredibly far off. This is so close. Uh, again, you know, it, I don't see any markings from any, you know, previous alignment in here. Usually you see little brass shavings coming off the shafts that go into the IF transformers here. So I'm really, uh, I'm really thinking that this definitely does have the, the factory alignment in it. So that's really nice to know. You know, the dials are so stiff as well. When I try and move the main tuning dial, it's so incredibly, you know, stiff to move. Whereas, you know, the ones that these re receivers that really have high mileage on them, they're just, you know, they almost float around. This is a very, very, you know, a tight, tight receiver. So all in all, this is looking really good. Between that and, you know, the RF alignment and everything and no marring on anything, it's, um, you know, it's pretty hands down at this point. I'd figure it's, it's uh, hasn't been played with, which is nice. You know, it's nice to come across one of these things every now and then. So who knows what happened? Maybe somebody owned this receiver and just lost interest and put it, put it away, put it in a box or, you know, well, maybe, yeah, who knows? Could be anything, right? So kind of incredible. So now what I'm going to do here is I'll go back to the wide position here. So in order to make this look proper, we want this to come straight up and over and down. Oh, I was going to also demonstrate the uh, AVC, the difference in the AVC. So I'll click this from manual, which it is in now, into AVC, and we'll see if we get a pattern change. We probably will. Oh, look at that. You see that? That's, that's quite a change in the pattern. Actually, if the center frequency was right here, that could be a desirable pattern, but it isn't. So um, you can see that this bump here is a little bit higher than this one over here. So, you know, it's got this stage curtain effect here. So, yeah, you can see how that's affecting it. So in the end, we would want to peak this up. And that's not what the pattern's supposed to look like anyways. It's uh, That's a really wide pattern. And really, um, you know, it should, even in the AVC position, it should look like this. So, of course, with that coming straight down without this little dip here. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and peak up this pattern. We're going to go for maximum amplitude right at the crystal frequency. We want to keep this right at that crystal frequency. And I'll see if I can shift it over a little bit because it's not right on, right? So uh, if I move this here, I'd say that that is, you know, the center of the IF right now, right about there. And if I go to the crystal position too, you can see it's, it's not right on. So I'll see if I can get it a little bit closer. And... Um, We'll try and uh, get maximum amplitude and get the uh, appropriate looking shape here. So another thing I should mention, and I hear this a lot, and I'm glad that I remembered this, is many people say, you know, when I tune the, the crystal selectivity control towards position number five, I, I notice that the amplitude drops quite a bit, and sometimes the frequency will even shift a little. And... That's absolutely normal. Don't worry about it. If you move it towards five and you know you're down in the noise, of course, there's something wrong with the section, but it's quite common for this to move. So what I'll do is I'll just give you an example of that right now. So this here is in the off position. All right. This is an example. This is position one. Position two. Now you'll note, watch the marker. Position three. Position four. And position five. So you can see how that marker is moving closer to the tip right now. So just say, to make this a little easier to view, I'll just go, I'll move the marker right to the tip, okay? So this is position one. This is two. 
This is three. You see how that's moving over? Position four and position five. That's absolutely fine. We're only talking the difference of, you know, maybe a few hundred hertz at the most. And that's basically breathing on that main tuning dial to correct that. So don't worry about that whatsoever. And the amplitude drop, this is in position five to position number one. That's absolutely fine. And you can see we're right now we're at five dB per division. So no problems. That's absolutely normal. I'm ready to start doing the IF alignment on this Hammerlin HQ140X and I'm going to leave the spectrum analyzer hooked up just exactly the same way that you saw it hooked up earlier. And what I'm going to do is tune the IF transformers for maximum amplitude at the crystal frequency. So if I go to crystal selectivity position number two here again, that would be right at this peak right here. But the very first thing I need to do is center up the screen. That just makes things a whole lot easier. So if I put this right at the center, I would say that it's uh, 453,560. So I need to go 10 down from that. So that'd be 443,560. So start 443.560 kilohertz. And now I'm going to go 10 above. 463.560 kilohertz. And that'll put that right in the center of the screen. Very, very close to. So now when I'm aligning it, I can know that the the peak should be right at the center line of the screen. Just makes things a, a whole lot easier to do that right here. So what I'm going to be adjusting in the receiver here is these right here. So I'll be adjusting these, these, there's more of those right behind here. You can't see them They're right beside the box. And then there's two adjustments on the top of the box. Basically what I'm going to be doing is just adjusting these things for a peak on the screen. That's all I'm going to be doing at that frequency. So I'm going to be moving these around and I'll just work my way from the last IF towards the first. And then I'll just be moving around trying to get that peak. And then in the end, I'll just kind of critique that. So take a look at the screen here again. So I want to be adjusting this in this off position here. So I'll start with the last IF transformer here. You can see that we're going down a little bit. Now we're going down again. So this is the bottom slug, the one that's closest to the chassis. Now I'll move to the upper one. You can see that we're losing amplitude again. You can see how that's kind of shaping it a bit. So I'll leave that one right about there. I'll move over to the next one towards the face. You can see the very, very slight adjustment of this one really affects this. That was about a quarter turn. Now I'll move to the upper slug. You can see I'm also shifting the frequency here, how it's moving that peak over. Now I'm going to go right, skip right to the first IF. Go to the bottom slug here. And you can see the peak is still there. And then I'll go to the upper slug. So I might need to actually shift the pattern over like this, and then go back to the bottom slug again and tune for a peak. Now you see how this is coming, looking a little bit more the way it should. Now the tighter we get this peak, the more narrow our audio is going to be. Remember we're at 5 dB per division. So if we were looking at this, it would be a little bit more broad and this here being a little bit more tight. So I've moved this over. So now if I go back to the upper slug again, I can probably just return this a little closer to the center. And you see that, how that's happening? So I'll go back to that second IF and I'll start turning this one here. You can see how that's affecting it. And I'll go to the upper slug on that transformer. You see we're getting a nice peak now. I'm just going to move this dot out of the way. You 
And this one here is that fourth IF transformer here. So now I'm going to be adjusting one of the controls on the upper portion of the crystal box, T2. So that's not poking out of the side here, but that's from the top of the receiver. Okay, so here we go. Now again, this is in the manual position. And we're just looking for maximum amplitude now. And I'm just using the screen for that. Kind of a course setting really is all we're doing. And I'll go back to these IF transformers on the side. And I think uh, we're pretty much at the maximum amplitude, just going back and forth here, just kind of critiquing things. You can see how the bottom slug here is shifting that frequency, the IF frequency. See how it's moving that peak over to the other side, right? And that is this slug right here, just a very slight movement. I'll try and get this in the shot. That's this slug right here. And that's just basically from here to here is doing that. So I'll move it over here, and you can see that it's moved. And that's just like that. So very, very slight movement affects this. So I'll just peek that back up again. And we'll just take a look at what our crystal is looking like here. You can see it's the peak is pretty much right at the where the crystal frequency is exactly what we want so now that this portion is done we've pretty much got maximum amplitude out of this what we're gonna do is critique this the way that this looks in the next shot what you see on the screen here is the result in tuning the IF section in this Hammerland HQ 140 X receiver to match their selectivity chart and it is very close now, to have had you guys along with me through this whole procedure wouldn't have been possible because there's about three, maybe plus hours, positive or negative 3 dB, in doing this. I really, uh, the, the time just flew by so fast. And the reason I spent so much time in the IF section is so that I can share all of the kinks in the IF alignment procedure in a receiver like this. So basically all these receivers, they really do have their own personality and they'll all align up just a little bit differently just due to, you know, component tolerance variation and, you know, the tubes, the strength of the tubes and, you know, line voltage, everything like that really affects this kind of a thing. And I have a lot of information to share with you, and I'll even show you the slugs that really affect, you know, the center of the, um, of the IF here the most. So there is a lot of stuff to cover here, so uh, we'll get started. So what you see on the screen You'll see the center is at 453, 360 at this point. And basically the crystal has moved a little bit. And the reason it has moved is because the chassis is now hot. It's been on for hours. There's two vacuum tubes just below this box. It's sitting on the side right now. There's a 6BE6 and a 6C4 vacuum tube radiating heat upwards towards the box. So it's heating the box. Now, whenever you heat anything, you get expansion of components, expansion creates frequency movement because things are moving apart. That's why for really stable crystal oscillators, they have oven controlled crystal oscillators that'll keep that crystal at a certain frequency or at a certain temperature so that it remains at its set frequency. Now in this receiver, this would be a close representation of this thing being stuffed in its case and the lid closed and being on for a few hours. So it's, I'm kind of glad that I did leave it run for this amount of time. It really has been on for you know quite a long time at this point. So I would say that it's most likely stabilized. Now everything will affect that crystal frequency, you know, what temperature your room is that the radio is sitting in and things like that. But really the amount of movement on the screen and to keep the, the uh, 
spectrum analyzer centered at the center of the screen and the, the amount of movement really isn't all that much to worry about. I'm just being picky because I'm trying to share everything I know about the alignment procedure with you guys. So it has moved just a little bit, you know, in the order of, you know, hundreds of cycles, right? So not a big deal. To be very expected in a vacuum tube receiver, especially of this era. So I'm measuring the width at the 6 dB down point. So what I'll do is um, the display line here, this is 0 dB right here, right? So you can see right up here, 0. And as I move this down, it's 2 dB per division. So if I go down three boxes, we're going to be at 6 dB down, right? 6 dB down right here. So how I'm measuring the frequency is if you watch the marker here, I'll move the marker to the right to the center. Okay. So now if I bring the marker down to this point right here, that's at the 6 dB down point. So what I'm doing is I'm measuring the difference in the IF frequency from this point here to this point here. And then I'm taking that and timesing that by two. All right. So whatever I get times two, because it's pretty even on both sides and that's going to be a relatively accurate representation of our IF width. So the results that I've got are on this chart here and it very closely matches this chart. Now to, to get this receiver to match this chart is going to take quite a bit of tuning and a lot of time visually doing this because there just is a lot of movement back and forth between IF transformers understanding which IF transformers shift the frequency the most, and I'll show you that. And then, of course, this receiver really wants to line up at about 4 KCs, right? It really wants to be at 4 KCs to get the, you know, everything peaked up and everything. So there is a slight amount of stagger tuning to bring this to 5 KCs, which they have displayed here. You can see this is 2 KCs here, and then it's 2.5 and 2.5, and and which makes 5 for the off position. So that's in no selectivity basically you have the uh, you're just dealing with the IF chain itself and that again is at this point so we're dealing with about five kilohertz here half of that box would be three right because this is basically two and then four at this line here so three is halfway through the box so about 2.5 at that point roughly and if you measure it you know you go back and forth and measure all this it's very close to five all right so we'll call that 5KCs at that point. So that's in the off position there. So at position number one, we're dealing with roughly 2KCs of width, okay? Or 2 kilohertz. If you want to call it kilohertz, if you're not used to KCs, uh, you can call it kilohertz. So about 2 kilohertz in position number one, and that's in crystal selectivity position number one. I'll move to that right now. If you have the IF section tuned properly with the crystal phasing where it's supposed to be, it should look like this right here nice and even, nice and straight up, no notches on each side. The, uh, the crystal phasing control should be pointing directly at the arrow right now, if this is tuned correctly. So again, from the peak, I'll have to adjust the, uh, the sensitivity on the face to keep this, the face of the receiver, to keep this right up here, because as we go into the selectivity, this will drop down pretty quick. We're again at 2 dB per division, so this is pretty sensitive. So again, two. What you see here, just bump that up to the top there, is about uh, 1.56, something like that, about 1.56 kilohertz at position number two. In position number three here, we're at 1.1 KCs. So 1.1 KCs, and that would be the third line, one, two, three, that would be this one here. This is the off position. And this is at the 6 dB down point right here. Hopefully this is clear enough in the camera. And then the next one would be position number four, which would be 680 hertz. And that's this here. So this is, we're getting now into CW territory where you're going to be trying to uh, listen to CW that maybe has a pileup, you know, close to it. That's right about there. So about 680 hertz here. So if you were to, you know, if there's a lot of CW and there was, um, you know, again, quite a pileup on, on the frequency or very close to it, if you wanted to really separate that CW, this would be where you'd want to be. And the tightest position here, which is this one here, again, the drop and gain is absolutely normal for these receivers. I'll just adjust the sensitivity control and there is a lot left. So right now we're at 520 hertz 
and that's at the uh, tightest position right here. And that closely matches the chart. So again, it's, uh, this is about as close as you're going to get to matching that chart in real world conditions. I'll just uh, put this uh, down the sensitivity here and put this back into the off position here. So you're going to find yourself using this position the most if you're a shortwave listener. Or, you know, if you just want to comfortably listen to sideband on this receiver, this or even position number one, you know, would be the two that you're going to probably use the most. So this would be one here. Now, in position number one here, if you have the crystal phasing working correctly, what I'll do is I'll take this up to, we'll say 5 dB or even 10 dB per division here. Okay. So at 5 dB per division, this is what it should look like or very close to. Now, we're talking just moving that crystal phasing knob ever so slightly off the arrow will move this around. Here, I'll just touch, touch that crystal phasing knob here and you can see how I've pretty much just almost evened that out perfectly and I'm just touching and it's right on the arrow so you wouldn't even notice the difference at this point really. Again, so if it's working correctly, this is what it should look like. Now, when I move this to one side, we should see a notch pull up on this side. All right, so what I'll do is I'll just move this over. And you can see that notch down the gain here a little bit. You can see that notch pulling up on the one side. So again, we would want to get rid of our offending frequency by pulling this notch up here on one side. And then if I return this back to the arrow, which would be at 12 o'clock, we're going to be around here. And then if I go the other direction, so now I'm going towards the number 10, I'll be turning the knob towards the number 10, you should see a notch pull up on this side here. And it should be relatively even from both sides. Now, if your receiver just say um, you're trying to tune the receiver and it's sitting at this or say it's sitting at this point right here just uh just a hair off of um you know the zero mark or i shouldn't say the zero mark the zero is at nine a hair off the the uh arrow that's at 12 o'clock all right if it's just a touch off you don't really need to worry about adding a, a trimmer into the box or something all you would do is just you know you can take the set screw out of the knob or even it has a, a flex joint between the actual knob and the crystal selectivity box here. So basically like a universal joint. You can just undo the sat screws and zero it up. It's not going to make that much of a difference if it's just off that one mark. And that would be the easiest way to zero this thing out. As long as you can pull an even notch up on either side, you're doing absolutely fine. So that's how the selectivity should work. Now, I'll go back to the the broad position here I'll go to uh, back to 2b db per division so we can kind of focus in on this a little bit here so you'll this is in the manual this is where they want you to tune this in the manual position but when you go to the AVC mode it's going it's going to change this it's what's going to happen and that's because we're again we're you know adding a negative voltage onto the grids of all of these tubes so it's going to affect the amount of current that's being drawn through all of the IF transformers and it will shift the IF over a little bit in this particular receiver it does that now that's not to really be worried about because if you're ever going to try and narrow in on a frequency or uh, you know some channel or something like that you would probably click this over to the manual mode turn the sensitivity down or if you're trying to narrow into a CW signal uh, this will remain centered, everything like this. So in the manual and the CW mode, this remains completely centered. If you're going to, uh, you know, run it on AVC, it's going to shift a bit here, and that's not really too important because it is in the AVC mode, and it is a, a wider position. It also widens up the, the actual curve here, which is really nice because it'll make for comfortable listening in, in the AVC mode on AM. Now, keeping this looking good in the AVC mode is a bit of a trick and there's a slug that really affects that in one of the IF transformers here and I'll show you which slug that is. So if I go to the AVC mode here, you can see that I'm now in AVC and it hasn't changed all that much but you can see the peak is just a little bit off. Absolutely fine, not a big deal. So what I'm going to do is up the gain here 
you can see that I'm upping the gain here. So what I'm going to do is move my reference level here. And I'll keep upping the gain. And you can see that when I get to the top, you see how it's widening out? So we actually have quite a bit of width here with it in the AM mode, or sorry, in the AVC mode, if we want to listen to an AM signal, which is kind of nice. So I'll just turn this back down. So you can see that the center is still quite a ways off. You can see it's, you know, it's moved quite a, a bit, but that's not a big deal because we're really not trying to fish anything out of the, um, let's turn this down here. We're not trying to really fish anything out of the, um, you know, out of the mud or anything like that. So that with the sensitivity control down, you can see how, you know, turning it way up, we can see we're going to be getting more negative voltage on the grids. And you can see how it's, it's moved the center and it's widened it up. Now, that's absolutely fine. Again, don't really worry about that. The, uh, the difference if you're listening to a nice AM broadcast signal between the center line and what you see here will be virtually unnoticeable. So again, if you're going to be pulling signals in on, you know, trying to really dig a signal out of the, out of the mud here, you're going to want to have this in the manual position. And you can see it just centers up. And then, of course, if we use the crystal selectivity at this, we can see the crystal selectivity is exactly where the IF center is. And that's what you want. So keep in mind, the AVC does move. So now here's the thing with the AVC. You can get a bit more gain out of the manual position by peaking this slug here on this transformer down here. This slug here really affects that, this one right here. So this is the one that's going to be what you're going to be tuning. This one, and there is a slug on the top here of this transformer. There's a, an L, one's listed L and one's listed T. I'll grab the piece of paper here. T2. So you can see T2 is this one right here. These are the two that are going to mostly affect what I'm going to show you right now. This one here and then on the top of the transformer T2. So I'll show you what this does, and it's just ever so gradual of a turn that does this we're talking like a quarter turn of that slug will affect it what you see here so i'm in the manual mode right now so what i'll do is i'll just give this about a quarter of a turn now you can see how that's narrowing it up and you can see how it's widening it up when i go in the other direction So we want it about here. So now in the AVC mode, when you go over to AVC, look what happens when I give this a, a quarter of a turn. I can really clean that up and make it look really nice there. But if I want more gain out of the manual mode, I have to go this way. And that's what it'll end up looking like. And it doesn't change much at maximum gain. So a nice balance between the two is about right there and that's what I've tuned for. So I go back to the manual mode, here we go, there it is right at that point again. And that's the difference of about a quarter a turn, maybe a little over a quarter turn of that, just that one slug on this transformer here once you've got your IF tuned. That's just this slug here. If we move uh, T4 up here, I believe that's T4 on the top of that, no T2, that's T2 up here. That's this one here, T2. If we move that, it will move the center over. We can adjust the center if you want to center things up. So what I'll do is I'll just show you a little bit of a movement on that. So I'll stick this, and we're talking, this is about a quarter turn max, I think at this point for this one here. I'm just gonna get this in there. So here we go. See how that moved the center right over? That wasn't even a quarter turn. Right, you can see how we're moving the center over to this side, so you can see how much that's shifting the IF peak. So those are the two that are, are will mostly affect moving everything around on here. So those are the two that you're really going to have to play with if you're going to try and tune this thing and get this as close to the factory selectivity curves like I've done here. So some of the intricacies in the tuning here, um, if you're going to try and use Hammerlin's procedure of basically coupling at the last IF transformer and then moving your way towards the first one, 
there is an incredible amount of interlock just because the other IF transformer is connected to the grid that you're going to be tying your signal into. So to give you an example here, if we look at the IF transformers on this, so they kind of want us to work back, all right? So just say we're going to try and tune this one and we have our spectrum analyzer tied into the grid of this tube right here. There's an incredible amount uh, an absolutely insane amount of interlock between this transformer and this one here. So you're trying to tune this one here. You're thinking, okay, I'll tune this for a peak. Very hard to do because if you just move the slug on this transformer a little bit, it completely changes everything. So these, both of these transformers are affecting what you're seeing, even though they're telling you to just align this one. So what I figure what they've done at Hammerland is they probably have an alignment chart and their alignment chart shows the curves of what they're supposed to look for when this is either bottomed out or all of the slugs are at a certain position halfway in or something like that, however they're starting this. So their alignment procedure that they're giving you is good for them at the factory, but not very good for a receiver that's been absolutely screwdrivered from the get-go. So if you have one of these things and you're starting from, from scratch, you're going to want to hook this thing up exactly the way I've shown you and just use this and move back and forth. First thing you're going to be doing is tuning for the peak at the center frequency. After that, you're going to be spending a whole lot of time trying to match their selectivity curves from just going back and forth and figuring out all the slugs. So from what I'm telling you, I can tell you that these will affect the, the waveform that you're trying to achieve very little. You're basically tuning these for a peak at the center is all you're going to be doing. You won't be tuning these very much. You'll just leave these alone. This transformer, T2, and the very first one, which is just down. I don't know if you can see this here. Yeah, just down in here. It looks just like this one here, but it's just off to the side here. You'll be tuning those a lot. So these are going to be the ones that you're going to be focusing on. Now, if you want to tune the, the crystal selectivity curve and match it, you're going to be tuning L2. So just leave L2 alone. Basically, you don't want to touch that until you're going to start working with the crystal selectivity. So leave L2 alone until you're in position one to five on the selectivity position. So if you move that around, that's the only thing that's gonna really uh, move this particular curve around. If I move that slug around right now, no matter where I put it, it won't affect this. So if I go in, into crystal selectivity position one, now if I was to tune L2, which is this one right here, if I was to tune L2, it would greatly affect the width. So that's what you're going to be doing. That's really the only uh, adjustment you have to match what you see on the screen to the selectivity chart. And that makes that particular portion of the tuning quite simple, which is really nice. So uh, tuning the crystal selectivity, again, just that one, one control, which is L2. And I really don't want to fiddle with that right now and show you the differences. Just touching that control completely changes this. It's that incredibly finicky. It is. So... Again, for all you guys that want to try and align one of these receivers, whether it be this one, the HQ129X, the 120, any of these receivers that require this particular type of alignment, if you don't do it visually, you're going to have a very, very difficult time achieving what you see on the screen here. Again, we're talking hours of me tuning this to make everything even on the screen. It might sound okay, but when it really comes down to pulling those signals out of the mud or getting the maximum performance out of this receiver, absolutely has to be tuned with some form of a visual means, whether it's a wobulator sweep setup or what you see on the screen here. This is how you align the beat frequency oscillator in a Hammerland HQ140X receiver using the visual method. So everything remains attached to the IF section the same way we had it attached in the IF alignment. The crystal selectivity knob is at position number two. The crystal phasing is pointed at 12 o'clock. The sensitivity control on the receiver is at a position where we can just see a signal on the screen here. The CW tone control is pointed at 12 o'clock, and this is important. It needs to be pointed as close to 12 o'clock as possible. At this point, the manual AVC and BFO knob is pointed in the manual position. And that's pretty much all we need to worry about right now. Of course, it's in receive mode and it doesn't matter where the limiter really is at this point. So 
right now we're just verifying that the crystal is still exactly at the center of the screen. That's the only reason we have this on the screen right now. And we're going to get rid of this here in just a moment. So as I adjust the sensitivity control, you can see the gain moves up and you can see we're still right at the center of the screen here. So we know that we're still at the crystal frequency. So what I'm going to do is turn the sensitivity control down on the front of the receiver and you're going to see this signal just disappear. So what's happening right now is it's stopping the signal from the tracking generator from going through the IF chain right now. So I'm going to replace that with the beat frequency oscillator signal. So what I'm going to do is turn that manual AVC and BFO switch to the BFO position and we should see the BFO appear. And there it is. Now, in order to align this, we need to bring that right to the center of the screen, just like we had when we had the sensitivity control up. So what we want to do is we want to match this to the crystal frequency. After that, we have the BFO aligned. So what I'll do is I'll just show you on the chassis where the BFO adjustment is. Right here is the BFO adjustment can, and in the side you'll see a screwdriver just kind of pointed right at the adjustment. If I give that screwdriver a twist, it will adjust what we see on the screen here. So I'll just point back up to the screen. So now what I'm going to do is just turn that control, which is moving a powdered iron slug inside of this beat frequency oscillator here and I'm just going to align that right to the center screen so here we go and that's it the BFO is aligned just that easy so now if I turn the BFO back to the manual position so it'll get rid of this signal right now because there will be no BFO injection whatsoever here and if I turn up the original sensitivity control you can see that they're both right at the center of the screen at this point you've adjusted your beat frequency oscillator now that the IF and beat frequency oscillator have been aligned in this Hammerland HQ140X receiver, we can now align the antenna, RF, and oscillator sections. And that's all the sections within this box here, and I'll explain this quite shortly. So all the alignment points that you see here are all the alignment points that you see here. So this is the antenna section. This is the RF section, and this is the oscillator section in this receiver. So for example, say you're listening to 1000 AM. So you're in the broadcast band, but the dial is pointing to 1300 or something like that. That would mean that the oscillator section here is out of alignment. The oscillator section aligns the dial to the frequency that you're receiving. Just say the receive is low, so it's not receiving as well as it should be. There's a good chance that the RF section is out of alignment or one of these antenna coils is out of alignment. Now there's a whole bunch of symptoms for low receive. If it has a bad IF alignment, it will also affect the receive as well. So taking a look at this piece of paper down here and all the alignment points, I'll just zoom on in on this a little bit. So you'll notice on here, we have all the ranges. So this is what's written on the face of the radio for the range switch. And these frequencies that you see here are the points of alignment. So this is where you need to tune your signal generator to align what's within the dotted line. Now, one thing that'll really speed up your alignment in a receiver like this or most receivers, and this is something to remember, is the coils always align the low end of the band and the capacitors always align the upper end of the band. So if we look at the piece of paper here again, we can see that the capacitors are at the upper end of the band and the coils are at the lower end of the band. And it's the same for all of them on here. So you can see there's kind of a V shape here. So it's showing us that this set 
this set and this coil here are what align the 1.32 to 3.2 megacycle range on this receiver. Now, this isn't where you put your signal generator. To align the upper end, it has to be at 3 megacycles. And at the lower end, it's at 1.4 megacycles or megahertz if you prefer. And when you're aligning a receiver like this, you always start at the lower band, which is the lowest band on this receiver is the broadcast band. And you work your way up all the way to the highest band. So they've started the broadcast band here, and this is one band up, and then it jumps all the way to this end, and then works its way back down over this way here. And that's how you go about doing the alignment procedure. Now, this is very easy to align up to what you see here. You see there's two antenna coil adjustments here. So if we look at the actual receiver, we can see the two antenna coil adjustments right there. So we know that if we were going to use this piece of paper and hold it up to the bottom of the receiver, you would be holding it up like this, and those would be all the adjustments. So what I'm going to do is try and set everything up now so that I can get everything into the uh, shot here or as well as I can. And we'll start with the alignment on this receiver. Just before we get started on the alignment procedure for this Hammerland HQ140X receiver, there's a bunch of things that you should know. One of them is that Hammerland has made a mistake in their alignment procedure, and I'll point that out quite shortly. And for some odd reason, they've not included a very important piece of information. And I'll have to show you the bottom of the chassis and how to set this up so that the actual receiver will align properly. So I don't know why they haven't done that, but um, at any rate, I'll have to show you that in the next shot, and we'll talk a little bit about that there. So what I'm about to tell you is, is kind of common for the alignment of most receivers, and I'll just go over that. So this can apply for solid state receivers as well, what I'm about to tell you, well, much of it at any rate. So before you start the alignment procedure on this Hammerland HQ140X, you should let it warm up in its case, and I stress in its case, for about 45 minutes to allow everything to temperature stabilize. Now, the alignment procedure on a receiver like this is very time consuming. And by the time you have removed this from its case and done the entire alignment procedure, the temperature will have dropped quite a bit because, you know, the chassis is really just airing off at this point and, um, you know, it's going to cool right down. So once you've done the entire alignment procedure, and I'm talking about just on the bottom portion of the chassis, this excludes the IF and uh, BFO alignment. What you're going to need to do is put it back in its case again, let it warm up for about 45 minutes again and then just touch up the oscillator alignment so that the dial accuracy uh, remains you know pretty accurate and this really is is necessary for an older receiver like this if you want to obtain maximum accuracy and you know the best performance out of the receiver now you don't need to touch up the rf or antenna alignments after it's been warmed up again really it's just the oscillator which is the most sensitive section to temperature in one of these receivers so something to keep in mind with any kind of old communications receiver that you want to obtain the maximum accuracy out of so this is why it's you know so time consuming to do one of these jobs correctly. So you shouldn't tie the output of your signal generator directly to the antenna jacks on the back of a receiver like this because the nominal impedance of the antenna section in one of these receivers is about 400 ohms or thereabouts. So if you tie a 50 ohm output of say your signal generator or if you have an older signal generator the impedance is all over the place uh, it's going to cause you to misalign the antenna adjustments and you know that could possibly work its way back into the RF stage on the upper bands. So you don't want to do that at all. You want to make sure that you're using an RMA dummy and if you don't know what that is you can just use the internet and type in RMA dummy. It's a very simple circuit to put together just a you know probably a maybe five or six components something like that and it'll allow you to achieve a proper alignment. Now this is a, a substitution that I've made for an RMA dummy for myself here, and I'll go over this here in a little bit. Uh, I'll do a separate video on this actual dummy itself. The reason that I've designed this and I'm using this in place of an RMA dummy, I've used an RMA dummy for years, and it works fine, all right? There's, there's no problems with it. Uh, this is just, you know, if you enhanced accuracy, I guess, uh, you could look at this, this little block here as being that. Uh, the RMA dummy, when looked at on a spectrum analyzer and swept, uh, has a very pronounced peak at the top end of the broadcast band, and that's just the way they are. So this box here is flat, well, very close to flat. It's within 1 dB from 60 kilohertz all the way up to 40 megahertz terminated into a resistive 450 ohm load, 
whereas the RMA dummy is definitely not. It's all over the place. So I'll show you that here in a future video, and I'll show you exactly how to build one of these things if you want something that's relatively flat to do your alignments with. So this is what I'll be using. Again, not so incredibly important with the uh, the, the um, antenna and RF alignments of, of any kind of receiver, just because you can turn the signal down. Basically, you want the impedance to just remain up around 400, 400 plus ohms into the receiver or the antenna portion of the um, of your receiver. So the RMA dummy will accomplish that for you. Now, if you're using an older vacuum tube type style of signal generator, of course, you're going to want to let that warm up until it stabilizes beyond the stability of the receiver uh, or very close to at any rate. Now, a signal generator like that uh, E200C that I just did has an attenuator section on the face of it. And really what they are is they're just potentiometers that are moving up and down. So really the output signal level is moving around as well as the impedance because you're, you know, you're moving those, those VRs up and down to set your output level at your, you know, desired uh, signal strength to align the receivers, you know, front end section. So one of these here is extremely important for that as well, the RMA dummy, because, you know, the impedance is moving around so much with different signal levels. Uh, you know, it can be as much as just a few ohms, you know, the, the impedance, the output impedance of that um, signal generator. So again, yeah, very important. Make sure that you have that uh, RMA dummy in line or you will reap the benefits of a bad alignment. So now that that's covered, let's see uh, the mistake here. Uh, the mistake that they've done here is they say on the on the sheet here it says frequency 6.60 uh, megacycles that's 600 kilocycles or in today's speak uh, 600 kilohertz and uh, it says modulation off well the modulation needs to be on and i'll show you why on their alignment sheet here so the alignment pretty much starts right here at number two it says here, with the signal generator connected to the receiver antenna terminals and the output meter connected to the speaker terminals, adjust L17 until maximum deflection is obtained on the meter. Well, you're not going to get any deflection unless there's modulation there because you're directly coupling to the output of an audio transformer and there needs to be an AC signal there. No modulation, no AC signal. So there's a mistake. So if... Uh, if you're following this, I'm not sure if they've done this same mistake in in previous um, alignment procedures. I usually don't even look at these because, you know, it's just so secondhand to me now. So just reading their actual sheet, I guess I should go over maybe some of the alignment procedures at Hammerlin, maybe even Halicrafters and all that kind of stuff and just see if they've done this kind of stuff. But but this is very important. If you're new to doing this alignment, uh, this you wouldn't get any signal and you'd be thinking, what's going on? I'm not getting any output signal. So you can use a VTVM or an oscilloscope. Any kind of age of oscilloscope should probably work for this. And uh, I'll demonstrate that here in just a little bit when we do the alignment. So they're telling you to adjust the, you know, the bottom portion, L17, the bottom portion of the broadcast band first. And then they want you to adjust the, the capacitor at the upper end to 1.25 uh, megacycles. And of course, as I explained, you uh, go from the lowest band all the way up to the highest band or the highest frequency, I should say. And uh, that would get your alignment done correctly. Now, a couple of the other things to note is when you get up to the higher bands here, there is a certain amount of interlock between the oscillator and the RF section. So you'll completely align the oscillator section up just fine. And then you'll go and peek up the RF section and you'll know that it'll drag the oscillator off frequency just a little bit. And that's just the nature of these receivers because this is, you know, operating at a really high frequency here for this particular design, up to 31 megacycles or megahertz in today's speak. So you're going to have to go back and forth a little bit. And sometimes, even in the older receivers, just removing these from the case and aligning these on a bench and then sliding them back in the case will affect the upper band alignment because you have the bottom case so close to these capacitors and coils that it actually causes the, uh, the dial accuracy to move a little bit. So uh, I know this particular model, they've moved some of the capacitors off of the bottom and onto the actual shield to, to try and uh, get rid of that effect a little bit. And I'll point that out here when we're in the bottom portion of the chassis doing the alignment. Now, again, the alignment procedure in something like this is so incredibly in-depth that I'll probably end up doing one entire band and showing you exactly how that works. And then you can pretty much follow that for all the other bands And if you're going to be doing this alignment yourself. So I'll choose one that has all of the... Uh, I'll like start with the broadcast band here, and I'll just do one that has even the adjustable antenna coil. You can see that 
in these upper bands here there are no adjustments here at all just it's just the two lower bands that have the antenna coil adjustments here so another thing to keep in mind is that when you're adjusting the actual uh, oscillator section if you're to look at this as being the dial okay so this is say 600 kilohertz here and this is 1.25 megahertz here so you can move the entire band around all right so the whole scale is moving at the same time or we can adjust each end independently when you go and adjust the coil at the bottom end of the band it's going to pull the upper end of the band down with it so you're gonna to have to go to the upper end of the band adjust the capacitor and it's gonna move the upper end but it's also gonna pull the lower end with it as well so you'll have to go back down to the lower end at 600 kilocycles and align this again and it'll pull the capacitor a bit and you'll have to adjust the upper so in effect you're just slowly stretching the scale and then if and or you can shrink it as well doing that same procedure and that's what you're trying to do you're just trying to match their alignment procedure basically stretch or shrink the alignment to the actual band and then when you're done that what you want to do is you want to go to say 900 kilohertz put your signal generator at 900 kilohertz and see if it lines up there and go in different portions of the dial just random portions and check to see how close the alignment is and usually it should be pretty close usually within a bar or so of uh, each side you know something like that for a receiver of this era so they, they align up pretty nicely so something to keep in mind that's one of the reasons this takes so long is because you have to go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth just in the oscillator adjustments to make this thing come on to frequency and it has to be done with every band and then of course it you know it gets more complex when you get up to the upper bands now you're dealing with instead of just going back and forth now you're going back and forth between four adjustments here on some receivers you may even find that when you're tuning the coil at the bottom end of the band that you can turn it and then you'll come on to frequency you keep turning it and then you find that you're coming on to frequency again and you're like where do i adjust this well the trick to that is basically turn the receiver uh well basically leave the receiver gain where it is turn your signal generator gain down until you can barely hear the signal and then go through that coil again and search for the strongest signal that you can find at that frequency so if you find it once keep turning the coil if you find it again and it's weaker okay so you know that it's weak keep turning it and keep turning it and then if it disappears okay back the coil up again until you find it say it's weak and you find it oh now it's really strong and now it's weak again and it's weak so what you want to do is tune it for the strongest signal so you'll find that a lot of the signals will repeat and uh and that sometimes happens in the coils and when you're tuning the upper band so that makes the alignment procedure a little bit time consuming as well so these are a lot of things that i've come across and you don't really find this information anywhere not a whole lot of people talk about this stuff so uh, if you're aligning a lot of these older receivers i hope this really helps you out it's um a lot of the stuff that i just i don't find anywhere but you know through so much you know experience doing these older receivers that uh i've just run across it so many times so what i'll do is i'll get the receiver up here and i'll show you how we attach everything to it to start doing the alignment and i'll show you that chunk of the alignment that they missed which is um pretty important the portion of the alignment procedure that they failed to mention was the adjustment of the antenna compensation control throughout the alignment which is right here so that needs to be pointed at 12 o'clock and the capacitor under that top shield needs to be half meshed so chances are throughout time somebody has taken the knobs off the receiver and cleaned the face like in most cases and there really is no way to tell if you've put that knob on in the correct area because there really is no stop that that knob will just turn 360 degrees and just keep turning and turning and turning so you really need to have the capacitor under that top shield half meshed you're probably thinking oh great i put the cover back on or i have to remove it well you can actually see that capacitor through a little hole right in this area here so you can half mesh that capacitor so if you find that the capacitor isn't aligned properly so say the dots pointing at 12 o'clock and it's fully open or fully closed or something like that what you can do is remove the little set screw on the knob turn the shaft keeping an eye through this little hole that's in here and i'll show you this in just a moment keeping an eye on that capacitor half meshing the capacitor and then pointing the knob at 12 o'clock sliding it back on that shaft and then tightening up the set screw again and then that'll align that capacitor so that it's in the right position for the alignment Again, this should be left at 12 o'clock throughout the entire alignment procedure. If you look carefully, you can see the capacitor in the middle. I'll just zoom on in just a little bit. 
Now what I'll do is I'll rotate the control here. Right now it is half meshed. And you can see the edge of that capacitor coming around there, the outer edge. So this would be fully meshed in this direction here. And you can see that outer edge. As soon as that little outer edge that you see glaring right now is pointed straight down, that capacitor would be half meshed. And that's where it needs to be to be adjusted. So right now that dot on the knob would be pointing at 12 o'clock. I'm ready to align the Hammerland HQ140X receiver now, and I'll tell you how I have everything all set up. So I'll start with the receiver here. We're going to align the broadcast band first, so the range switch is in the 0.54 to 1.32 megacycle position. The dial is pointing exactly at 0.6 megacycles, or 600 kilohertz, or however you want to look at that 600 AM. Very important, the band spread tuning knob is pointed at 100 on the logging scale, and it needs to remain there throughout the entire alignment. So everything that's done on the bottom portion of the chassis here that knob needs to be sitting at 100. It doesn't get touched at all throughout the entire alignment procedure. If it's off the 100 position, your entire alignment will be out. Very important. The standby receive switch is in receive. The sensitivity is pointing at 12 o'clock. And that pretty much is, you know, just picked with the signal generator output that I've got chosen right now. The manual AVC and BFO switch is in the manual position. And we're pretty much ready to go at that. So my signal generator is exactly at 600 kilohertz or 0.6 megacycles or 600 AM. It's modulated to 50% by a 500 hertz tone and the output is just at 60 microvolts. So it's just set at that level. Haven't really touched that. So since my signal generator is at 600 AM and the dial is pointing at 600 AM. I should have a signal on here right now, but I don't because the dial is not exactly aligned. So since we're at the lower end of the dial, I have to tune this coil right here and we want to tune this for the biggest signal that we can see here. So what I'll do is I'll put my insulated screwdriver into this right here and I'll turn this until I find that signal. And here it's coming. And there it is. So now the dial on the face is aligned up with the signal generator at the lower end of the band. Now we can go to the RF section and peek up the RF section. You can see that we have the signal here, but we want to see if we can get more amplitude happening here. So what I'm going to do is put the uh, adjustment screwdriver in this coil, and this is in the RF section. Now, if I can get any more gain out of the RF section, the amplitude will increase of this signal here. And look at all that gain that I just achieved by tuning this. And last, we'll go right to the antenna coil, and I'll peak that up as well. And look at all the gain we got out of that. So now this is aligned at the lower end of the band. So what I'll do is I'll move this to 1.25 megacycles on the dial, and then we'll adjust the trimmers, the actual capacitors. The receiver is now sitting at 1.25 megacycles. That's this knob right here. And the signal generator is programmed to be at the same frequency. So everything still remains the same. If you find that you need to increase the output RF level of your signal generator to get a, an indication on the scope, that's absolutely fine. Again, just leave that antenna compensation control pointed at 12 o'clock. So what we're going to do now is tune the upper portion of the band and align it. So here we go. And there it is. So now the dial is aligned at the upper portion of the band. Now keep in mind that it may have moved the lower portion, so we'll have to go and check that out. Before we're done here, what we want to do is also peek up the RF section and see if we can add any more gain to this. If this signal gets bigger, we're increasing the receive of the receiver. And look at that. So this particular section right now is 
tuned here to its optimum. So now what I'm going to do is go back to 600 kilohertz AM and see if we still have a signal there. And if not, we'll have to touch it up and come back up to this portion. I'm back at 600 AM and you can see we're relatively close, which is kind of nice. So what I'll do is see if I can get any more gain. If the amplitude increases, that means that I'm getting it on frequency at the point of maximum amplitude to where it starts to go to the other way is where I'm right on frequency. So you can see I passed it. Right there would be right on frequency. So now to finish this off, I'd have to go back to the upper portion of the band and check 1.25 again, align it and then come back down here. And if it's right on frequency, this particular alignment is done for this band. So what I'll do now is I'll remove the oscilloscope and I'll show you the same procedure using a VTVM. Now, this oscilloscope here is just a really old oscilloscope back in the day. You know, this is what you used for probes. You just use some wires. This is very old. It's about, uh, oh, 1938 or so is the era of this. It looks to be a clone of the RCA 151-2 or something like that. So there's no RCA written on it, but it's built exactly the same. And I don't know, maybe it is just some sort of a like a clone or maybe an experimental an oscilloscope that uh, maybe they even put together i really don't know it has all rca parts inside it so you can get an idea you can use any old oscilloscope to do this it works just fine or again you can use a vacuum tube voltmeter like the one in the background there and i'll show you how that works here in just a moment the vtvm is hooked up to the same area that the oscilloscope was hooked up to so basically just across the speaker terminals I don't think I mentioned earlier the volume control or the audio gain control on the receiver is just set to a level to give comfortable deflection on the oscilloscope or on the VTVM. So since we need a signal at the audio output, we definitely need to have the audio gain control up just a little bit. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to see if I'm very close to 1.25 megacycles. It looks like I have a bit of movement on the needle here. It's, it's not right on the zero. So I'm probably close to the frequency. Now, a lot of people might find this a little bit more comfortable to use because the needle on a VTVM is very sensitive. And especially on a big movement like this, you can really narrow things in. And I'll give you an example here. So the signal generator is at the upper portion of the band again. And so is the dial on the receiver. It's pointed exactly to 1.250 megacycles. So I'll just put this in here and to in the upper portion again and see if we can get any more gain. So if the needle moves up, I want the needle to be at the maximum point and that would mean I'm right on frequency. So I'll just turn this a little. See how I'm passing it now? I'm going down so I need to go the other way. You can see how sensitive this is. Right about there is at its maximum point. So right now I'm on frequency. So you can see how sensitive this is. So you might prefer using a vacuum tube voltmeter instead of an oscilloscope as well. It works just as good. And then we would repeat, go to back down to the 600 kilohertz and do exactly the same thing over again. So basically this display is just replacing the oscilloscope that's below it. That's all. So now what I'm going to do is go through and align the rest of this receiver. It's going to be a rather time consuming process here. So to do this all on camera would take a very, very long time. So I'll get this all done and then we'll test out the performance of the receiver and see how well it works. Well, it looks like we may have some troubleshooting after all. So I've got the alignment pretty much done. This is the first go. I'll probably go through it one more time and just touch it up. And then when it goes back in the case, I'll probably give it a final again. Actually, the alignment on the bottom side here was out quite a ways. So probably somewhere through time, somebody was in here or again, you know, somebody just aligned it too fast. The odd thing about the alignment in this receiver originally when I first tried the thing out it seemed to be somewhat on frequency and yet these coils here were pretty much bottomed right out there right at the end and you can see how much difference you know what a difference there is in the length now I've, I've wound them way out in order to uh, get them in the correct spot so and it's the same with the uh, RF section so it was receiving you know okay but now it's 
absolutely incredible to receive on this is really good. There's no antenna hooked up to it, there's just the RMA dummy, and I'll turn the volume up a bit. And that's how hard it's trying to receive at this point with no antenna, and that's... The knob, the little dot on the knob is pointing at maybe just a little bit past 9 o'clock. So it's, um, yeah, it's really trying hard to receive now. So it's, um, you know, it's working pretty good. But, here's the big but. So I'm listening to this thing and I click it over to the manual position and turn the RF gain down and I start to hear this cracking and popping noise and I'm thinking, yeah, it's probably just because, you know, maybe it's overloading. But then I click it back to the AVC and the crackling and popping is still there. And that's not right. And then I turn the sensitivity control down just a little bit and the popping kind of disappears and then you turn it up and it's fine and then I click it over to manual again and then all of a sudden it just starts popping and crackling like crazy and I'll see if I can demonstrate it right now so there's something in here in this area that we need to troubleshoot and, and find out what that is because it's some sort of an intermittent crackling component or something in here at any rate so I'll turn the volume up here I have the signal generator on a, a, a frequency that the dial is tuned to right now so if I it'll get quiet when I put the signal generator on so now there's a carrier happening if I turn the uh, the modulation on on the signal generator you can hear it in there so so now here's the thing, it's in AVC right now, right? It's nice and quiet. Hear that? So now I'm going to click it into the manual mode. Listen to that. Sounds like sizzling bacon. So if I turn the sensitivity down just a little bit. You can see it kind of goes away. But when it gets right to the top. Almost sounds like that resistor in the Heath kit. I think this is much worse though. So now, let's see if I can make it remain. If I click over to the AVC mode, it might hang around. Yeah, it's still there. You can hear it very slightly, but it's there. So it's kind of a rush. So. On some really, really strong stations on the AM broadcast band, it gets really bad. It seems like the stronger the station, the more it starts to crackle. So there's a bunch of things for us to, you know, pretty much start thinking about. So in the AVC mode, it doesn't want to do it. In the manual mode, at maximum gain, it does. So that initiates it. And then after it's initiated, if I go back to the AVC mode, it'll hang around. If I turn the sensitivity down, it kind of stops a little bit but it's still in there and then sometimes it'll completely quit but if I go back in the the uh, manual mode it kind of kicks it back in again and it starts it up again so there's a whole bunch of things there I should call them clues to where this is going to be so what I'm going to do is I'll go get that uh, Heath kit signal tracer that uh, one that I I did the um, the video on not too long ago and um, actually, uh, it had a, a noise in it just like this. It was a bad resistor. So I'll use that to troubleshoot the problems in this. And we'll see if we can locate the, the noise with the, um, with the signal tracer and an RF probe. And I'll get into exactly how I'm going to go about doing that here quite shortly. I have the Heathkit signal tracer on the bench now and I'm ready to start sweeping around in the circuitry here looking for a noisy component. And I'm going to do that with this little probe that I designed some time back. It's a high sensitivity non-contact RF probe. 
and it's designed to just basically sweep around in the circuitry and look for noisy parts. So in the future, I'll do a video on this. It's a very, very simple probe to put together. If you have an empty probe case, this is just an old junk probe case. Uh, if you have an old empty probe case, it'd probably take you 10 minutes to put together point to point. It really is quite simple. You can almost twist the parts together and, and away you go. So very, very handy thing to have around. And uh, you'll see what I mean here quite shortly. So I imagine the problem is going to be in this area here, just because the manual and AVC switch control what's up in this corner. What's down over here is just the audio section and the power supply, really, and the BFO and stuff like that. So it's most likely going to be in here, and I'm really, really hoping that the problem is not inside one of the IF cans, because if it is, I have quite a job ahead of me. I'm going to have to remove the IF can and completely redo the whole IF alignment again. So I'm really hoping it's under here. So anyways, what I'm going to do is reposition the camera and I'll focus it in this area here so that you can see me what I'm doing in here and sweep around. And uh, hopefully we can find this noisy component using this method. And if this method doesn't work, we'll try something else. Okay, let's try and locate this noisy part or whatever it is. So that's the speaker of the receiver right now doing that. So what I'm going to do is turn the receiver down so that we don't hear it out of the receiver speaker. I'm going to hook the common or the negative of the probe up here. And I'm going to turn the signal tracer up. And I'll just move the probe around inside the chassis here. So if there's a noisy component, if there's any kind of scratching or sparking or anything happening around in the area, this will definitely pick it up. So if there's actually arcing inside of a component, this is very, very useful for finding that. This area is pretty quiet, aside from the IF. You see how sensitive that is? So you can actually tell if the entire IF chain is working with just this probe, just by moving it around in the chassis and getting close to the plate leads. Well, I'm certain to hear some crackling. There's a pretty consistent sizzle right down here. Hope you can hear that. Now, one thing when you're looking for a noise like this, not to get that confused with that rushing noise in the background, that's just a sign that the IF is working. So this loud noise. We don't want to get the noise confused with that. We want to just listen for the crackling. And there's a mixture of it right in here. You hear that? But if we bring this right down by this capacitor here, there's a continuous hiss or sizzle. So what it's telling me right now is it looks like it's in this little area right here. So it gets loud by this 820 K ohm resistor. And 
and there's a consistent hiss right over this mica capacitor here. Hear that? So at this point, to narrow this further, what I'm going to do is change the probe to a contact style RF probe and I'll start touching some of the pins on that tube and the surrounding components in this small area and see if we can narrow this any further. I have the direct contact probe hooked up so let's see if we can locate the issue with this probe. The reason I have it in the alligator clip is because it'll get pretty noisy if I uh, get it away from the chassis. As you can see, not only that, the light is imposing a lot of noise into this probe right now. So it was really noisy around this capacitor here, so there's a lead that goes to a tube pin and comes right up to here, so let's see what we get. definitely some noise there and it was also noisy around this 820 k ohm resistor so let's see what we get at the tube pin here pretty noisy there but well pretty close to the same so I'll just bring this over this capacitor here again Now this probe is nowhere near as sensitive. So it's looking, this is attached to this capacitor down here, directly to the cap. And this is attached to a resistor here. just test stuff around here this is on the other end of that resistor now there's also a cap going to ground off this so if there is any kind of sparking or arcing inside that uh, resistor it's not going to be too present at this end So, what it's looking like to me is that it's either that 820k ohm resistor or that mica. And there's also a resistor soldered across that mica capacitor. And at the factory, it looks like they've soldered that resistor right at the body of that mica capacitor. So, uh, whenever you solder a resistor to a capacitor like that, it's always good to solder it away from the case because the resin or whatever they're using at the time to make the solder take uh, when you heat the case up over time it can seep into the case especially when it's directly above this resistor that's absolutely blazing hot so this is continually radiating heat up onto that capacitor as well so there's a really good chance that it's either this capacitor there's that resistor across it or that 820 k ohm resistor so what I'm going to do is remove those two components and we'll give them the noise test on the Heathkit signal tracer and see if we can find anything that way. I very carefully removed only one lead on each component out of the circuit just to keep the stress on the components down. Any movement of these components at all can sometimes heal that intermittent problem for a period of time and we definitely don't want to do that because that's going to really prolong the troubleshooting procedure.
You can see that I've bent this 820k ohm resistor in this fashion so that I can get the test leads in there. I was very careful not to bend the lead where it enters the body of the resistor, but only to bend the lead where it's soldered. If there's going to be a noise issue with this resistor, it's going to be within the body and any movement of the lead at the body can sometimes again fix that issue. Same thing goes for the capacitor as well. I just clipped the capacitor right out of circuit. I didn't even desolder it. Just, you know, minimal amount of heat, minimal amount of tampering. So I've got the Heathkit signal tracer ready to do the noise function. So I've changed the probe basically just to a pair of wires. So I have a shielded cable here with a pair of alligator clips at the end. So the barrel of the BNC is connected to the shield here and the center conductor is attached to this alligator clip here. Now, when I click the Heath kit signal tracer into the noise position, it's going to put a high voltage on this probe here, and it's going to put high voltage across the component. Now, while it's putting high voltage across the component, it's also listening to this lead at the same time. So if there's any kind of staticky or crackly connection inside that resistor it's going to be very loud at the signal tracer and that's how the noise function works on these signal tracers if you're interested in the signal tracer i did a video on this one and i'll just link it below the show more tab right below this video you can check it out if uh, you find this interesting the noise function on these signal tracers is overlooked a lot of the time and it's a very very useful function so what i'm going to do is clip the negative lead or the common lead to this end of the resistor because this is the one that's still attached into circuit here and I'll put the hot lead on this end of the resistor and what I'm going to do is click it to noise so it's going to place high voltage across the component now and I'm going to turn up the gain and you can hear it's that's just audio amplifier noise it's just it's quiet so I'll let it sit for just a moment just to make sure that there is no noise there. That's with the gain almost to the maximum. So this component is quiet. So there's nothing wrong with that 820k ohm resistor, I'm pretty sure at this point. By putting high voltage across the component also causes heating within the resistor itself. So if there's going to be any issues with this, it would have shown up by now. So I'm going to turn the gain down on the Heathkit signal tracer and put the tracer back from the noise into the tracer position so it removes the high voltage on this probe here. It is very low current, but still enough to give a nasty shock. So one end of this capacitor is tied to the chassis, so I can just clip the negative lead of the tracer to the chassis and I'll clip the hot lead right up to the capacitor here. I'll put it into the noise position and turn the gain up. And I think we found a problem. That's a pretty noisy part. Now there's two parts there. It could either be the capacitor or the resistor. So I'll just replace them both. That's really noisy. So you can see how useful this function is along with using those probes as well. That was a really quick find. I'm quite surprised it went this quick. As you can hear, as it's heating, it's getting worse. And that's with the gain control on the signal tracer just off the zero mark. So it's very noisy. So I'll replace that resistor and capacitor combination. Turn this back into tracer mode here. So that resistor and capacitor, the resistor is 270k ohms and the capacitor is 100 picofarad. So I'll replace both of those. Again, 
not soldering the component right where the leads enter the other component but keeping that away and that should fix the issue and then i'll get back to the alignment finish the alignment off and then we can listen to the receiver and see how well it performs the restoration of this hammerland receiver is now complete aside from some minor cosmetic work that i can end up doing to the case here so in a moment i'm going to zoom on into the face of the receiver here and i'll cruise around the bands and we can take a listen to the receiver see how it sounds and check out its performance so this should be a very accurate representation of the way this receiver sounded when it rolled off the factory line back in the 50s. So the way I have the microphone and speaker and everything set up here is to kind of capture the roomy feel of this room here and to give you the most, I guess, realistic reproduction of the way this thing sounds with me sitting here playing with the dials. So a few personal observations about the way this receiver performs already. I've already listened to it a little bit and tuned around the bands. Hammerlin did a really nice job of taking the audio and putting it kind of on a nice, I guess you could call it balance point between comfortable broadcast band listening and communications audio quality. So I can see that they, you know, really played around with the IF for a while to give it that curve. And then of course, designed the audio section to, you know, tailor the audio after that. And in a moment here, you can check it out and, you know, you be the judge of the audio sound and the way that the IF works in this receiver. I think they did a really good job. As for the sensitivity of the receiver, it's absolutely fantastic. In fact, it almost has too much receive. So it's really working well and it's sensitive right up to the top end of 31. So right up to the top end of the, uh, the last band, which is 31 megahertz here. So they did a really nice job of this thing. So at any rate, enough of my talking, I'll let you be the judge of all this. So what I'm gonna do is just zoom on in on the face and we'll start cruising around the bands. Here's a listen to the broadcast band late into the evening. So we should be able to hear quite a few distant broadcast stations coming in from all over North America. In fact, there's probably quite a few of them that are doubling with one another. So we might hear multiple stations on the same frequency at the same time. So let's take a listen. Coming back to you with a great title, because uh, Our Savior did it all, and all to him we owe. You've asked us if we confess that Jesus nice, is Lord. Nice voice quality there. The community, country, military, and law enforcement. I don't know real estate, but brought to you by Core Group Realty. And major power play by Herman Keith. It's pretty, it's pretty fun. It's and, cool. Uh, the people that it's actually, they're going to ask Jazz, are you playing? This might be really a complimentary premium. I don't even have those parts in that sound thing. <laughs> the experts documented 560. Our charity of the month. It's a great time and a great way for us as recreation <laughs> And free pool all day, every day. Free, the exercise. Well, no, whether it's strippers or... I'm ahead of the second place Vikings in the NFC North. I'm Matt Crater. Bill or more. When you can get Viagra for less... Same tactic, a simplified checkout. Uh, <laughs> women in the welfare alliances get a job. I mean, there that mentality's out there. <laughs> weren't doing that 20 years before, and that's because people have to do one. I must have her cousin. And when you think loyalty and sentence and pricing towards any... A lot of people have been at this point. All right, I've got to com congratulate you. Thank you. For one, the voice. It is possible. First, you set a budget. It really is all about... I am very See what it takes to be worthy. It takes toughness, dedication, and perseverance. Mom and pop operation. And, and, and vegan diet is 100% plant-based, meaning no eating animal flesh or fish. Oh, <laughs> 25th. You've got America's president and CEO Paul God. Hey, you get caught in a few. Since the last time we chatted, you 
So much for your heart to reach people around the world. It's my heart. I know it's your heart. So that's one portion of the broadcast band. The uppermost portion, you have to move the tuning range switch. And it starts at 1.32 megahertz down at the bottom end. the second portion of the dial here. the way to get it done yesterday. Have one really high though, purchases. Yeah. 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 And you say too, but you go into this a little bit, it kind of about the, yeah, uh, kind of the cyber security approach and avoiding. Oh, Pretty big signals up here. Planning for your estate. Please include the Albany Public Schools Foundation. Even a. Live or on demand, anywhere, anytime. Se caracteriza por paz, por And that's pretty much it for the broadcast band. So just so many stations in there, you could spend a lot of time just really searching the one out that you want to listen to and find some really interesting broadcasts late at night. I'm still on the 1.32 to 3.2 megacycle band right now, and right now I'm at 2.5 megacycles or megahertz, listening to the time signal, and that's pretty much all the action on this band right now. So this is a good example of the noise limiter. Now you can see how that didn't affect the intelligibility. So I'll roll up the band. So to read about here, now I'll click the noise limiter off. Pretty good noise limiter, works very well. And the rest of the band up here is just going to be really quiet right now. So next, we'll listen to the 3.2 to 5.7 megahertz band. Here we are on the 3.2 to 5.7 megacycle tuning range. Let's take a listen. Now we're in the 80 meter amateur radio band. Some side band in there. Five or six years ago, but it still works. I was on it the other day, just I plugged it in and threw it online and popped open it so all the updates could get straight down. It works just fine. 
uh, I don't know, I kind of like the Apple iPad. Some AM action on 3885 there. By the way, that's where this antenna is resonant. So this is uh, the most sensitive rate in this particular range. So the antenna is uh, tuned right here. So we'll see if we can cruise down the band and listen to some sideband. I'll show you how to do that. Very simple. Here we go. Sensitivity down. This to the BFO. This should be pointed at either minus one or positive one, depending on where you are. And I just use this as a fine tuning. I saw a man up to 75 and so there's some sideband action here. You can see how easy it is to tune these guys in. We use the crystal selectivity and get rid of a bit of the hash and focus in on him a little more. See how much that helps? Yeah, the FM20, that one. They want 300 bucks for them out of Japan. Yeah, they are. I agree with you. They didn't sell for about 120 okay, new. I stole mine. I had one, Dave. I sold it on eBay. Yeah, I know. So there you go. Works very well on sideband. Very easy to use. So you just have to remember that there's no AVC action in the BFO position. So there's no meter action. That's why you have to turn the sensitivity down. If you don't turn the sensitivity down, this will happen here. Let's uh, just turn this down. You see, it sounds garbly. So it's very, uh, very uh, important to turn the sensitivity control down in order to tune them in. A lot of people just click to BFO and try and tune around, and they figure that these things don't tune in sideband very well. Well, they work just fine. It's just that you have to turn the gain down a little bit. That's all. And this receiver has a lot of that. Okay, so let's cruise the bands again. So back into AVC mode. Crystal selectivity is off, and we can turn the sensitivity right back up. There's 3885 again. You can see it's tuned for here. It's just very sensitive. Actually, when I got Windows 10, I went along for a lot. Lots of action on What you're hearing there is something that's actually moving up or down the frequency like this. You can hear it come on to frequency when you see the needle get to its peak. So it's just sweeping up and down, some sort of information that's sweeping. I think I might be able to follow it if I move the dial quick enough. You can hear it, you can kind of follow it. I just can't return quick enough. So anyways, that's what they're doing. I actually showed this signal in uh, my earlier Hammerland video with the pan adapter. You can actually watch it move across the screen on the pan scope. So we should be coming up on the time signal now. Make sure I have this right on 100 here. So there it is. It's kind of 
interesting. Some side band up there. And that's pretty much it for this band. So on to the next. Here we are on the 5.7 to 10 megacycle range. This is in the 40 meter range. sideband action in here. Good. 
So right there is uh, another time signal. It's the 10 megahertz time signal. But my standard in here is mixing in with it a little bit. So my uh, frequency standard is at 10 megahertz. You won't hear the difference between the two frequencies because they're extremely close. If there was a difference in the frequencies, you'd hear a tone. There is no tone there, aside from the tone that the WWV had going there. This is the 10 to 18 megacycle range. I've waited a little longer into the day to listen to this tuning range on this receiver here just so that it's a little bit more active. So let's take a listen. We're starting off at 10 megahertz. So this is the time signal that you're listening to right now. side band action there. That's in another amateur radio band. So we're coming up on the time signal again here at 15 megahertz. just starting to come in. Absolutely. 
And that's the end of this range. As the day progresses a little bit more, uh, this area will get a little bit stronger. Here we are in the 18 to 31 megacycle range on this Hammerland receiver right now. And there really isn't a whole lot of action up in this area. For example, like the 10 meter band where we're in right now or the 11 meter band, it's just been very quiet. And that's just due to conditions. In fact, the conditions haven't been very good up here at all lately. But there is a little beacon in the 10 meter band here that we can take a listen to and it's basically transmitting Morse code here so we can listen to that and you can get an idea of what it sounds like. I'm already in the BFO position and I have the sensitivity turned down. So as this beacon slowly goes away it ramps down in power and stages and then it starts up again at full power. You can hear how that well that crystal selectivity control works. It works very well. You have to be right on frequency though in order for this to be loud and at the, the tone that you've selected. So if I move this off frequency, the sensitivity of the signal or the, the strength, I should say, of the signal here will go down and the tone will also change. So when you're tuning a person in, basically if the CW tone is set correctly, I find comfortable around either negative or positive one. And then what you do is you just very slowly fine tune around until the tone gets the loudest and it's at that point to where the tone that you're actually used to. So you'll find there's two things that change. The pitch of the tone and the strength of the signal will move down. Now the BFO, when you're in BFO position here, there is no meter action. So you can't tell when you know it's peaked up to the maximum or when you're right at the center of the IF curve or right at the crystal frequency. So you have to do a little bit of listening, but it is pretty easy to hear. So, so what I'll do here is I'll just tune in and uh, I'll kind of sweep past it and go back and forth and you'll see what I mean. It'll get really loud. See how it got really loud there? And that's right at the center of the IF curve right there or right at the crystal frequency. As I move away, you'll be either going down either side of the slope on that IF curve and it won't be as sensitive. That's why it's so crucially important to have the crystal frequency right at the peak of that IF curve. So at any rate, that's it. That's how the receiver performs. I can show you how sensitive it is up here. It's really quite sensitive. So go here, just move off frequency, turn the sensitivity up, peak everything up. That's the static level up here in the 10 meter band on this receiver hooked up to an 80 meter antenna. So if that gives you any idea of how sensitive this receiver is, it's working very, very well. Just a few final notes and some reminders for the alignment of this receiver. So 14.200 megacycles is where you should align the S meter. At least that's where I found it to be the most accurate. You can follow the rest of the instructions in the manual, 50 microvolts for S9. Don't forget that 
the S meter alignment should be the very last thing that you do. So you'll align this entire receiver first and then do the S meter alignment last. Don't forget to zero it mechanically and electrically. Don't forget to also peak the antenna knob when you have the supplied signal going to the antenna jack for this S meter alignment. You must peak that knob or it'll be way off. So the antenna knob itself needs to be adjusted to 12 o'clock or the cap half meshed before any of the alignment happens. And both of these things were not mentioned in that manual. This is very important information and I don't know why they didn't put that there. Remember, no direct connection from a 50 ohm signal generator. Use an RMA dummy or in the future I'm going to do a video on this little device right here. Works very, very well. So keep in mind that if you do use this, and you're watching this video after I do the video on this, keep in mind that if you terminate this box into 450 ohms, if you feed the input 100 microvolts, you're gonna have 50 microvolts out here. This box is almost purely resistive to this point. So somewhat of a divider in there. So keep that in mind. If you terminate this, it's gonna be half of what you put in. And again, when I do the video, I'll go over this, or if the video is already done, take note of that. On the higher bands, tune the slug for the strongest signal, and that's in the oscillator section. So you're, you'll find a, probably a couple of points on the coil if you're you know, turning the, the actual adjustment on the coil and you're winding the slug out or in on, in one of the oscillator adjustments at the lower end of one of the bands. You'll probably find that you'll find the frequency twice. You want to tune it for the strongest signal. And a nice way of doing that is using a VTVM across the speaker jacks and uh, with a modulated signal generator. So that works very well for that. The differences will be minor, but it means a lot when you have this thing in real service. So make sure that you do that. Also take note of the interlock between the stages, the RF stages. So what's going to happen is when you align the higher bands, so everything is at the at the alignment points you'll notice that when you adjust the RF stages it'll drag the alignment off so just be leery of that the signal generator must be modulated for the oscillator RF and antenna, antenna alignment here so just remember that they made a mistake here modulation has to be on not off and that's pretty much it so Good luck on your alignment and good luck on the repair. Just remember that this receiver's got lots of high voltage in it. So if you're going to be doing any alignments on this stuff, take care. Don't zap yourself. Know the precautions of working with vacuum tube gear. Once again, can't stress that enough. If you do any of this stuff, you're doing so at your own risk. Good luck. Well, here we are at the end of another restoration video. I hope you enjoyed this one. If you did, you can let me know by giving me a big thumbs up and hang around. There'll be many more restoration videos coming in the very near future. In fact, by the time you finish watching this video, chances are I'll be well into my next restoration. So until next time, take care. Bye for now.